All right, let's get this started. I'm going to do this a little early today. I had going to do it at 6 o'clock, but Erin has something streaming on her channel with Tina. I don't think I'm going to finish at 30 minutes, but I'm going to sure try. Um, I don't have a lot to talk about. Uh, I just wanted to go over a few things that uh, I have seen the last couple of days. Somebody sent me a clip of the Aether's experience with uh, Apologia and Matt Dillahunty, which pretty much has solidified um, my position that Matt Dillahunty is, is not somebody who just doesn't understand these things. I think, he, I think he does, but it's just full on lying for new atheism. And so I want to do a quick stream on it to kind of get uh, that out there uh, to the public. Basically, a couple things he's also said on Twitter that uh, I'm going to be showing you guys that just, it just boggles my mind because he's been told these things so many times. He's even talked about these things, and yet he seems like he keeps going backwards to try to, to I don't know, placate to an audience or try to just um, do sophistry. So it's, just, it's the only word I think fits what he's doing. It's pure sophistry. Like I said, I want to get it under a half hour if I can. If not, if it goes over, that's fine. This content is kind of a lot different than what Aaron's doing on her channel with Tina. But I do want people to watch Aaron and Tina's video because it's, you know, kind of a history of what happened with a few things that went down on the Internet. But I'm not going to dive into that. But I am doing a stream tonight at midnight with Aaron, if you guys want to join that. Uh, it will be showing emails that have never been shown before, so you might have an interest in that. But let's kind of dive into this, make sure my audio is okay, make sure you guys can hear this. And like I said, if we can finish this in a half hour, that'd be great, but I expect probably 45 minutes. So anyways, let me give you a setup on this. Uh, somebody has sent me this, this clip here, and uh, basically they, they, they thought the caller made some errors, which they kind of did, and they thought Matt made some errors, which they kind of did, but I think Matt was actually kind of right. Um, on most of this, so I, I, I don't want to like crap on him completely. You know, he, he did get some things very, very much correct. But the problem is, is that when he talks about this stuff on Twitter and some other things, he makes them fundamental again. I, I don't even want to call them mistakes because they're not mistakes, they're lies. They're no longer mistakes. He, he, is, he knows the subject matter. He understands the epistemological uh, underpinnings of these things. He understands the philosophy. He's not stupid in that department. So the only explanation I have is he's being sophistic and he's just doubling down. He's lying. That's it. So I'll see what you guys think on it. But anyways, this was from the eighth experience the other day with Paula Gia. Um, Paula Gia does nothing wrong in this. Um, Paula Gia is one of the, the actually one of the best, um, I think, atheist apologist, if you want to call it that, or is, well, especially for someone who talks about um, young earth creationism and refutes against it. He is one of the best. Um, and, and so I don't watch the Aether Experience. I don't know how he interacts on the Aether Experience. I've only seen this particular clip, and I didn't see any issues with Paul Gia. So, of course, I have nothing to add about that. But Matt, of course, there is a few things that he says that I, I kind, of, kind of question. But let's kind of dive into this. So let's do this first before I get into the, the Twitter stuff that he was just completely, completely wrong on. And let me know if you guys can hear this just fine. Oh, actually, you can't hear it just fine. Um, I already know. I already know you can't. <laughs> Say one sec. Come on, Steve, get all this together before you know you go live. The problem is I had all this together, but unfortunately my uh, internet wasn't working too well, and then it just all of a sudden came back and was working fine. So uh, I apologize for my attempt earlier. Here we go. The call. I'm ready. I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, I'm going to take this call, and uh, he's calling specifically for me. I'm and, fine. I got copy. <laughs> and then Paul, Paul's like, you know, hey, I've seen the show before. I usually this, the co-host usually sits here, and does nothing while you do everything, Matt. Anyways, right? <laughs> then we'll dig on on other things. So, Clarence, uh, welcome to the show. Kind of. Uh, we had a brief discussion before the show started, where Clarence called me a narcissistic sociopath and then a coward. Um, but okay, um, <laughs> I have to pause there. Um, I don't think. Well, shoot. I don't, I don't think Matt's a narcissist. Uh, I think he's an egotist. I think he has a massive ego, but there is a difference between egotism and narcissism. Uh, people like Kyle is a narcissist. People like uh, Matt Berherd are narcissists. People like Katie Jo Paulson are no narcissists, in my opinion, of course. I'm not saying I'm medically uh, any kind of expert to diagnose them, but in my opinion, those are what I consider to be narcissists. I don't think Matt's a narcissist, but he has the ego the size of Texas. Um, is he a coward? No, I don't think he's a coward. I mean, he, he, he does engage with a lot of people. I would have to say that he doesn't engage with people that will probably show that he has errors that um, he doesn't want to be shown, right? I mean, he, he just will not engage with me, nor will he engage with anybody that can show that I'm right in many things that I say. He just hangs up on those people. So I, is that cowardice? To some degree, but I, I, I'm not going to go so far to call him a coward. Um, 
he's got this point about uh, the logical absolutes, which aren't absolutes, they're misnamed. And, well, that's uh, not that's not necessarily I'm happy true. to address it. Um, <clears throat> they are called the logical absolutes. They're not misnamed. They are absolute in the classical schema. When you're de dealing with intentional and logic or classical logic, they are called the logical absolutes. They are absolutely true in all possible worlds. So I don't know why he said there that they're not logical absolutes. Now, people can argue they're not laws of logic. That may be true, right? That Calling them laws of logic is somewhat of a misnomer, but I don't have any issue with calling them logical absolutes. Of course they're logical absolutes because they're true in all possible worlds by necessity. No, I, I, maybe that's quibbling. Maybe that's quibbling, and I'll, and I'll accept that. But I don't have a problem with them calling, being called logical absolutes. I don't see that as a misnomer. Laws of logic, sure, that it is a misnomer. They're principles of logic. So what's your point here, Clarence? Welcome. Thank you, kind of. Uh, you have often made the point that one can um, either has to be convinced or unconvinced of the existence of a God. And the point I'd like to make is just very simple. In order to be convinced or unconvinced, the word convinced implies that you have considered the issue and are either convinced or unconvinced. Okay, and I happen to agree with that. Um, convinced is synonymous with belief. You can use them interchangeably. Belief is the, the word for an epistemic disposition when you hold the propositional content is true. Um, and to, to believe something, you are convinced of it. If I believe something, it is denoting that I am convinced of it, right? Uh, you can't say I believe A equals A, but I'm not convinced of it. That would be a contradiction. That makes no sense, right? So it is true. You either believe a proposition or you do not believe a proposition. There's no argument there. Matt has repeated that numerous times, and he's not wrong on that. Um, and Clarence is not wrong on that. Both of them are correct on that. Oh, and by the way, to be aware of the proposition, um, you you still either are someone who believes or you don't believe it. But if, you'll see here that what they're going to try to argue is that if you're unaware of the proposition, then this doesn't apply, which is not quite the case. If If you're unaware of something, that means... You don't believe the proposition if you're unaware of it. The problem is I think Matt uses a very bad uh, analogy here, and we'll, we'll get into that here. However, it is possible pe for people to exist, and people have existed, and I can give several examples. Um, uh, people exist who are totally unfamiliar with the concept of a god. And someone who is totally unfamiliar and has never even been exposed to the concept of a god is neither convinced or unconvinced. That's again, not true. Because the That's not true. Now, now, I, I, again, I am fair when I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being fair. Matt is correct on that. Uh, Matt is correct. Um, if you're, if you're, someone who doesn't know about the proposition, you are unconvinced of that proposition. You are epistemically unaware of it. There's, there's no such proposition to you to, to have a position on, right? Graham Oppie calls that position innocent towards P, innocent towards the proposition. A person who is innocent towards a proposition does not believe the proposition because they are unaware of the proposition, right? That is a strict dichotomy. You believe or you don't believe. There are no other options in classical logic. So if there are no other options in classical logic, you believe or you don't believe, you don't get to all of a sudden have this third position that doesn't exist. Even if you don't, you know, um, even if you don't um, know about the proposition. Now, there are some interesting nuanced exceptions, but only under the guise of if the categories don't actually exist. For example, a theological non-cognitivist would argue that they are neither theist nor not theist, which would be to us epistemically impossible. But to them, those categories are not even categories to even exist in. There's nothing to exist in, right? That's, that's how the theological cognitivist, I think, would, would look at a position of what is theism? What is not theism? They, there's no, they're, they're incoherent categories. Therefore, they would not be in either one of them because they're not categories to actually be in. But there's a difference there because they're, so, they're saying that the categories are meaningless. It'd be like saying, an example I could think of would be something like, are you in the category of uh, colorless green ideas that sleep furiously, or are you not in the category of colorless green ideas that sleep furiously? What does that even mean? They're, they're, those are not actual categories. They, they're categories that don't exist, right? They're incoherent categories. 
That's how I would look at the theological non position. But just being unaware of, of a proposition, then you, you clearly can't believe something you don't know about, right? So I, I happen to agree with Matt on this particular part. The, the, the no. word unconvinced... No, we're we're pausing right here. here. You, you, you seem to be confused and equating the notion of not being convinced with being disconvinced or something. Um, all I'm saying is that for any proposition, you are either convinced of that proposition or you are not convinced. This is a A slash not A scenario, and those are the only options. He is so correct. If someone says, are you convinced of Fergal and you've never heard Fergal you don't know what a proposition is, then you cannot possibly be convinced of it. Well, and this is, this is where it starts getting a little bit interesting, that if you haven't heard of the proposition, that's not the same as the proposition not existing completely, like in a theological and cognitive position, right? But I, I, at this part, Mar Matt is arguing, look, here's the proposition, but you're not aware of it. You're not, I haven't even told you what a fer, you know, anything about Fergal Burgle. So at that point, yeah, you don't believe something if you're unaware of it, right? Uh, somebody asked, hey, hello, Brian, how are you? He says, wouldn't that person has never heard of the proposition an atheist, the theological cognitivist? Well, it, okay, so personally, I have a slight differentiation between atheist and theological and cognitivist. Don't take this as gospel. Um, this is just what I infer from the literature because there is some, there's some vagueness revolving these terms. The ichthyist would say that any God talk is meaningless. In other words, it doesn't have any really uh, cognitive meaning to it. It doesn't have any context or, or um, uh, meaningful dialogue with it. Now, the theological cognitivist would say that a proposition dealing with that particular subject matter is non-truth apt, meaning that it cannot be assigned a truth value of true or false. Are they related? Yes. Do I think that all ichthyists seemingly have to entail Theological and cognitivism? Yes. I think that they, I think they're codependent on each other in some ways. I don't know how you'd be an ichthyist to say that God talk is meaningless, but you'd hold a proposition relating to God truth apt. That would seem to be, to be a contradiction. But I hold that theological cognitivist is a very specific position relating to the propositional content being true or false and not being able to be true or false. So that's a little bit different than the ichthyist who just says all God talk are, is meaningless. But there is relationship there. Right, and they are used interchangeably in many contexts, which I don't have a problem with. They, I think, for all practical purposes, they can be used interchangeably. But I do have a slight nuanced distinction in the literature of one being used specifically more to talk about when somebody doesn't think the God talk is meaningful, as opposed to somebody who thinks that the proposition with a God talk is not too apt. Does that make sense? So you are still in the I'm not. Hey, hey, Kenny. Hope you hope you're well. Hope you're well out there, Dr. Kenny Rhodes, from uh, Reasons to Believe that I used to uh, do a show with years. Well, well, I guess it's been about two years now. You're convinced neither category. convinced or unconvinced. I know. Let me, let me know what you think, there, Kenny, of this so far. Oh, you're There's saying that. I know you're saying that, Clarence, but you're wrong. I have. Let's. Well, we so disagree. I, that. Hey, would you stop well, talking? Clearly, they, you, clearly they disagree. Okay. I, did you think we were going to agree, Clarence? Don't know. I thought maybe you would consider my argument and agree with it. I did consider don't. it, and so I'm explaining to you. I did consider it, and I'm explaining to you why it's wrong. It, and Clarence is wrong. I mean, up to this point, Matt is absolutely correct. Uh, would you guys agree that that Matt is correct so far? Do you, would you like me to do that, or do you want to just sit here and be confident in yourself without being rebutted? I I would be glad to listen to it. Go ahead. Good. I, then I shut the fuck it, up. Okay. I have written down on my table here a proposition. You have no idea what that proposition is, do you? That was a question. Okay, do you see where he's going with this? This is where I think it, it jumps the shark. Now, this may be a little nuanced here, so work with me here, okay? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to explain this the best I can the way I'm visioning this. Let's say he writes a proposition down on paper. Let's say the proposition is... A equals A, right? Now, being unaware of that proposition that he wrote down is not the same as being unaware of the proposition itself. I'm aware of the proposition A equals A, but I'm not aware of the proposition of what he wrote down, right? There's a big difference there. There's a big difference of what he is. If the, if the question was, are you familiar with the proposition 
The answer is yes. Are you familiar with the proposition that Matt wrote down? As in, do you know what he wrote down? Then no, right? There, there's, a, there's a difference of, I would have, the word I guess would be ignorance. You're ignorant of what the, uh, the proposition is. So when he says, hey, you don't know what proposition I have here, I'd be like, no, I don't. But if, if it's a proposition that I'm aware of, then I either believe it or you don't believe it. I, can't, I cannot give you a, a, a posi- I cannot tell you if I believe it or don't believe it because I don't know what you wrote down. I am without information about what you wrote down, but I, I, that doesn't mean I'm unaware of the proposition itself. You see the equivocation there? It, it, there's, a, there's a nuanced but distinct difference there that I've seen. Are you going to answer the question? I have no idea what that proposition is. Okay. Right. Are you Clarence convinced right. that my proposition is true? And my answer to him on that would be, I cannot answer that question. I may believe it, but I'm not aware of what you wrote down. That doesn't mean I'm not aware of the proposition. That's what innocence on P means, that you're unaware of the actual existence of the proposition, not what he wrote down. I am neither convinced or unconvinced because That's I not what I asked that. And, and, and this is where I think both of them talk past each other. It's not that he's neither convinced or not convinced, right? What Clarence should be saying is this. I am either convinced or not convinced, but I don't know which one it is because I don't know what you wrote down. Yes, I fall into one of those two categories. If it's a, if it's a truth app, you know, something that, you know, exists, it's a category that exists, something, right? If you actually wrote down a category or I mean, a proposition, right? If you didn't write down a proposition, then obviously, you know, I, I, I don't have a position on it. If he just wrote down the number six and he asked me, you either, you know, um, believe the proposition or you don't, I'm like, what, what does that mean? I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I believe that five exists or something, but I mean, th- there's nothing that I neither believe or don't believe something that's not propositional, right? Because it has to be propositional to be, be believed or not believed, right? So it only could be believed or not believed if it's propositional. If it's not propositional, then neither one of them exists. Same thing with the theological cognitivists. They would say that neither those categories exist. You can't believe something or not believe something if it's not a proposition, right? So that's how, that's how I kind of work in the theological and cognitivist position. They say, well, I'm not a theist, nor am I not a theist. And people say, well, how are you neither? Because they're holding that neither category actually exists. To them, it's saying, I'm in the category of, you know, five or not five. Well, but that's not a proposition. It's, I, I, not five is not a proposition. You, could, you know, that's not the same as saying negative five, by the way. But I mean, what is, what is, was not, is five true? What does that mean? Is not five true? No, those are not propositional content. So this is what I'm saying. It, 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 to me, it takes a little bit of, little bit of nuance to sussy things out, which is very difficult to do when you're calling on these shows. But right now, I think they're talking past each other, right? But let me know. Do you guys, do you guys follow along so far? Do you think that uh, I'm right on this? And by the way, I may not be. This part right here, um, you know, it is very, very nuanced. Uh, when I get to the, t- the Twitter stuff where I can show Matt completely is lying, that's where the fun starts. This is kind of just an entry thing because uh, somebody has sent it to me. That's not what I asked you, dishonest fuck. I said, are you, in fact, convinced that my proposition is true? I don't know. That's a yes or no I question. I'm neither convinced or I'm convinced. No, Clarence. No, it's not a yes or no question. It is... Yes or no, that you either are, but whether you believe that or not, what position you have, you, you, you can't say what position you have on it. That, that's, how can I say what position I have on something if I don't know what you're asking? You know, like I said, if you wrote down the color, the, 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 if you wrote down the number five and said, you know, are you convinced this is true or not? I'm like, I, I don't know. How can I know whether I'm convinced or not if I don't know what you wrote down, this proposition or not? Right? So. Prince. This is a yes or no question. I didn't say, are you unconvinced? I said, are you convinced? And so if I say, are you convinced? And you say, I'm neither convinced, then your answer to my question is no, you are not convinced, correct? Incorrect. I am neither convinced okay. or unconvinced. You are, you are flat. How, I don't understand that. Again, this is where they're talking past each other, right? This is literally where they're talking past each other. Um, it is true that you're either convinced or you're not convinced, but that doesn't mean that you uh, know which one it is if you don't know what the proposition is. Wrong, and I will explain this to people who are going to be you honest and discuss Clarence, I need you to stop. I need you to not <laughs> use the word. Oh my God, Paul is so loud. He, he's got this super duper mic and super duper gain, and he's got this really professional radio voice that just blows my eardrums off. Word unconvinced again during this call because because that's the problem. You're using this word unconvinced. What I need you to only use the phrase non-convinced, okay? 
because the the phrase unconvinced is where you're going completely. I, I don't see a difference personally there. Unconvinced, not convinced. I, I don't particularly see a difference in the semantics there. If you're unconvinced, you're not convinced. Completely off track. So just if you can not use that for the rest of the call and just say non-convinced, all right? I have a statement written down. Do you believe that that statement is true? Are, are you in fact convinced that this statement is true right now? The answer would be, it is unanswerable, Matt, because you are unaware of what was written down. It is, in fact, I do, I am convinced, or I am not convinced of what you wrote down, but I don't know what you wrote down. Right? There's a difference in what is being discussed here. The proposition itself, yes, what, if you wrote down a proposition and I'm aware of that proposition, then yes, I'm either convinced or not convinced. But I don't have the information of what proposition you're talking about. Yeah, it is kind of petty fogging. I, 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 no offense to Paul, I just don't understand the difference between, you know, uh, if you say you're unconvinced, then you're not convinced. I don't see the, the distinction, right? Um, but I don't know would be the right answer. Yeah, I don't know. Are you convinced? I, I don't know if I'm convinced. I don't know what the proposition is. You know, it's like saying, um, if, if I said, hey, Sarah, uh, I have a thought in my head. I, do you believe, you know, what my thought is? Do you agree with my thought? And you're like, I, I, I don't know what your thought is. I, I may. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, if, if you have a thought in your head and it's propositional, I either, you either believe it or you don't, but I, you have no idea what I'm thinking. It is a non answerable question. I think this is a very, very sophistic um, example that Matt is using. And, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm still going to give the guy... A little bit of principle of charity. I can't after you see the Twitter stuff. I cannot. Uh, his principle of charity, charity is shot. But we haven't got there yet. But for right now, I'm going to give Matt a little bit of credit. To, and maybe he really thinks this is a good example. I don't. I think that it is. Um, I think it is. This is sophistry. Right. But. Well, you know, what, what do you guys think? I don't know because I don't know the state. No, no, no. By the way. Um, I'm just going to say this once. Play nice in the live chat with each other. I don't need any of that other stuff. Um, so just play nice or you get timed out. I don't care who you are. And hi, Sarah. So just. Well, you do know that you are not convinced. No, the word convinced implies that I am familiar with the statement and that I've. Yes, it. in order to in order to become convinced. Fine, I'm muting you. I'm muting you. Yes, in order to become convinced, you have to be familiar with the statement. Yeah, you have to be familiar with the statement, but not what you wrote. There's a difference between the statement and what you wrote down. These are conceptualization issues. I could be familiar with what you wrote down as the concept in my head, but I don't know what it is you wrote down. And then the weight of the evidence in favor of that proposition has convinced you. But until you've been presented with the proposition, you are not convinced. And until you've been presented with sufficient evidence, you are also not convinced. Okay, let's, let's follow that reasoning there, Matt. Let's say you wrote down the proposition A equals A, and I use that because it's just so easy. It's so simple, right? It's, you, you know, it's obviously, except if you're John Richardson is from the um, Atheist Alliance International, uh, he's the only person I, I think argues that A does not equal A ontologically, which is bizarre. But... Um, most people that are rational assume, <laughs> you know, A equals A, right? So it's a very simple proposition, right? And some people argue a proposition requires a little more some syntactical con content to it, and that's fine and dandy. I'm not trying to be appended on it. So to me, A equals A is propositional. If you want to argue it doesn't have the right syntax to be propositional, it really depends on what I've seen in the literature, and I don't care one way or another, to be honest with you. It just, it just is non, it's not relevant to me. To me, a equals A is a proposition. If you if you think about that way, I don't need to like. Um, I don't think you really need to be that much um, technical, right? So, because um, you're just basically saying, you know, the proposition A equals A is true, or you know, it is the case that A equals A, right? So A equals A proposition. So let's say that he wrote down A equals A. Well, I do know A equals A. I believe that, and I. So when he says, do you believe it or you don't believe it? Well, I believe it. Well, how can you believe it? You know what I wrote down because I know what A equals A is. It's a different, he's having what's called a um, category error, I think. The category error is he's trying to relate the content of the proposition itself that I do believe with the content of what he wrote down. And those are two different objects. They're not the same thing. Not being convinced of a proposition does not mean 
that you are convinced the proposition is false. So let's see if we can agree on that. Would you agree that if person A is not convinced that the proposition is true, that that does not mean that person A is convinced it's false? Which, of course, is the is correct. If If you are not convinced it's true, it does not mean that you are convinced it's false, which... This part right here sets up going into the Twitter. He is actually saying right here that there allows for a third middle position, which is the position of neither believing true or false. He's he's literally saying right here. Well, I shouldn't say it's, I hate to use the word literally with him because he, he one time he said like Steve needs to stop using literally as figuratively, and I showed him all this documentation about how literally has actually be used as the word figuratively um, in modern vernacular. Because uh, words, you know, have usages, and he's actually being prescriptivist on it, which he labeled me a prescriptivist. I'm like, dude, I'm a, de- I'm a total descriptivist. And he's trying to mislabel me dishonestly as a prescriptivist. And I'm like, words have usages. And the word figurative, uh, literally, is also used to denote figuratively. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not, I'm not a grammar Nazi. I don't particularly think that language has to be specific. I just say if you're going to use certain terminologies, this is the ramifications for it. That's when I wrote the, re- the refutation of the presumption of atheism by way of semantic square of opposition. I wrote that because if you use words a certain ways, these are way, this is what happens to it. It leads to a semantic collapse, right? Um, Lord Brian asked, am I wrong to say I don't know because I wouldn't know what you wrote down as, as, the, pro- 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 as the said proposition? Nothing wrong with that. You, how do you, you don't know what he wrote. Like I said, if he wrote down A equals A, and I say, well, and he says, do you believe or don't believe? I'm like, um, I, be, I believe. And you're like, well, how do you believe? And I'm like, <laughs> you don't know what he wrote down, but you, you know what A equals A is. Because if he were to say, well, I wrote down A equals A, and you'd be like, well, yeah, see, I believe A equals A. I, you know, you were right on it, by, by luck, obviously. But, but if you said, I, I, if he says, do you believe or you don't believe? And I say, well, I don't believe. And he says, well, here I, it was A equals A. Then I would have a, either a contradiction or I'd be wrong, right? So there's a difference there. There's a distinct difference. Yeah, uh, Yudahef says, when you use the word literally as figuratively as being hyperbolic, totally use, fine use it. Yeah, of course, uh, absolutely. But I, I remember Matt got on my case one time on, on, on Twitter. I'm like, really? The, the person calling me a prescriptivist is saying that. The irony, right? And by the way, I know that's not how the irony is used. So don't get on my case about that. Again, one of those misused words, irony. Uh, but, you know, even then, uh, it's one of those things. Well, yeah, it's the, the reason certain words do have a little bit of change of, of, of meanings is because a lot of times they are misused. Uh, your, your irony is, is misused. Um, because it's used a certain way, you know, in literature, and then people have started bastardizing it to mean something else. Uh, and same thing with the word, um, oh, what was the other word that was, uh, oh yeah, uh, the word jealousy and um, envy. They're kind of more synonymous nowadays in usages in, in literature, even though there, there used to be a distinction between them. If you're envious of something, or someone, that means you covet what they have. You, you want, they have something you want. You envy them. Jealousy is them. You're scared of them taking something away from you. If like if I have you know a, a beautiful girl on my arm, um, and some guy hits on her, and I get jealous, I'm you know jealous that he's going to take her away. Not that's going to happen, right? But um, this is this is called a hypothetical, guys. Hypothetical, right? <laughs> Not that I would have a beautiful girl on my arm, but some guy's going to take it away, uh, or both. <laughs> Depends on who you ask, I guess. Um, but. That's the difference between envy and jealousy, right? One is what you are, you want, the other one's what you're afraid you might lose. And so in common, you know, general parlance nowadays, those words are getting conflated so much that there is just some overlap there that they, they can be used synonymously, right? And interchangeably, even though that it probably wasn't the case of that 50 years ago. Isn't it ironic? Right. Don't you think? Yeah. So, all right, so let's continue on. Say that again. Yeah, if you were listening, I wouldn't have to. I'm listening. Here we go. The last part. Shut up. Uh, Here, let me mute you again. Paul. I I won't even even use abstractions. Okay. Well, how do you know Paul exists? I'm just kidding. Paul. Do you do you believe Paul exists? Do you know Paul exists? Has. Paul has shit. Oh, I didn't catch that before. I could have sound bite of that, you know. Paul has shit. <laughs> no, <I'm just> 
Paul is not convinced that I have a million dollars in the bank. Does that mean that Paul is convinced that I do not have a million dollars in the bank? That's the question. No. Why? Because agnostic. I mean, this is what kills me. He actually has explained to people, look, if you don't believe something's true, it doesn't necessarily entail that you believe it's false. Why? Because you can believe neither. What is that position called? Agnostic. Has Paul been presented with the with the claim Gee, that you have? Goodbye, Clarence. I'm sorry that you can't be honest in this discussion. That was a simple, straightforward question. Goodbye, sir. But you notice the sophistry there, and uh, you know, and you know, Clarence doesn't seem to be too too exceptionally bright either. But um, I mean, there just seems to be some sophistry there, and there seem to be some miscommunications. And again, this is why I would never call these types of shows, right? Um, with, with the atheist experience. I, I, other shows are fine, and, I, and people want to call into my shows, and that's great. But I would never call um, the atheist experience because they just they talk past each other, and it's just not worth the time. And you know, you know Matt's never going to, even if he does read my paper, which, by the way, has gotten over 400-some-odd views and in the top 0.5% of all the papers read this month so far. 0.5%. It went from the top 10% to the top 5% to the top 1% to the top 5%. My paper that I wrote has been read more times than any other paper on the site from academia.edu in the last 30 days. The top 5%. Not any other paper, but I mean within the, the, that group of 0.5%. That is amazing. Amazing. And I will let you guys know, because you guys are you're kind of to join me tonight, so I will give you a little bit of a uh, foreknowledge on it, I guess. Um, Dr. Demi, who I took a lot of you know my logical framework from, um, has agreed to review my paper. How awesome is that? No, informally speaking, but how awesome is that? You know? Now, I will tell you, I will go on record. That if Dr. Demi says it's completely hosed, I will renounce my paper and figure out how to fix it. Because that's what an honest person does. Right? Because it's based a lot on his work and Dr. Briggs Jackson's work and Dr. Oppie's work. So even though I've had a lot of PhDs with Logic review it, um, you know, I don't know what detail they went in. But, I mean, he knows what he's doing because it's based on his work. If he does find an error with it, um, I either correct it. And if he just says it's completely hosed... Um, yeah, I will. I will. You know, take my paper down because I don't want my paper to, um, you know, to have errors in. I, I don't want to have misinformation. Why? Because I think that's honest. I think that's intellectually honest, right? So I'm telling you guys that I, this is why I'm, I'm telling you ahead of time because I want to be transparent. That if he finds it to have errors, I'm going to take it down. Oh, else I didn't have to tell you. I didn't have to mention that Dr. Demi was reading my paper. And he could have said, "Hey, your paper's crap," and I could have left it up. But I, I just couldn't do that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have the the con conscious to do, you know, the, um, what is it? The, um, in good conscience, I couldn't do that, right? So I will let you know what he says. And uh, it may take a while, so don't expect it in any, any near future, because he said when he gets to it. But he was very, very nice, very, very polite. Um, and so I appreciate that. All right, so let's move on here to the good stuff. To the good stuff. All right, so this, this happened on, of course, Twitter, the cesspool of the internet. Now, uh, I, uh, my, if my sound's all over the place, I apologize. I'm trying to be as, um, the audio levels, I'm trying to, to normalize as much as possible. I've been fiddling with them because I just never seem to get them right. So if it dropped off, it probably was my noise gate. So I, I don't want to take the noise gate off. If it does again, let me know, uh, Holly. Yeah, Holly. Um, by the way, um, Holly, don't you, don't you have a if I don't if I forget, don't you have something? In P, a P, do you have a PhD in philosophy, Holly? If I'm if I'm recalling correctly, I don't remember. Is that you? I mean, I know I know Rhodes has a PhD in theology, but didn't you have a degree in philosophy, Holly? Or is I'm thinking of something else? All right. So this was something that Matt Dillahunty said, and I'm not going to go into the whole thread, but he just said, friendly reminder: apologists are still asserting things that can't be demonstrated. And we can dismiss those claims with no further thought. I don't take umbrage with that. Okay. Now, whether they can be demonstrated or not is, is opinion. Okay. But, you know, if you, could, if you want to dismiss something because it hasn't been, um, you know, demonstrated to you, meaning not acceptance, 
Okay, that's based on evidentialism and then some other reasons for that. I mean, it doesn't necessitate that. It doesn't mean that if you were presented no evidence, you never should accept something. That would be epistemologically flawed, right? It just means you can, right? You can if, if you choose. And, that, and I, I'm okay with that. I like the word you can there. Here's where it goes off the rails. He says, until you demonstrate otherwise, God not only isn't perfect, he isn't at all, implying that he doesn't exist. Now, I will, will ask you all in the live chat, what fallacy is this? Again, I think this is sophistry. Because, again, I, I used to chalk things up to just maybe he had some misconceptions. But this, again, I think he's being sophistic. I, I think that he knows better, right? But what fallacy is this? When you say, um, if something isn't demonstrated or not proven, I'm going to hold it to be false. Because he's saying at all, meaning that God does not exist. So if you say God does not exist until you demonstrate God exists, there's a fallacy of that, which he's well aware of. I've heard him talk about this fallacy numerous times. This is what I'm saying. This is why I think he's engaging in sophistry. Because um, I, I just don't give principal charity with him on this any longer and stuff like that. Because I think he's willing to use sophistry and lie for uh, New Atheism TM. Do you, guys, do, you guys, do you guys know what fallacy it is? By the way, my light chat broke. Are you guys out there? Hello. It's awfully quiet out there. Give you, give you a few seconds to catch up there. Let's see if you guys could figure that out. Do, do. Oh, I, if I say the Jeopardy thing, where I get a content ID match, da, 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 do it. It's syncopated so it doesn't match any content ID. Can you guys still hear me? Hello. I hear a black swan honking. <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we're going to get into that, Skeptic770, that he could call the null hypothesis. Yeah, that's the next tweet, actually. It's not a black swan fallacy. Um, black swan fallacy is basically an inductive thing that you can't ever exclude the possibility of some, you know, bizarre, way far possible, low probability event happening with using induction. Okay, but that's not actually a fallacy. A black swan is a misnomer. It's not a fallacy. It's not really technically a fallacy. Black swan fallacy, and I hate the name of that because, again, it's not really a fallacy. Black swan is just basically saying when you use induction, even things that have very low probabilities that you wouldn't expect can happen and often do happen, like finding a black swan, right? That's black swan fallacy. Um, John says in... In, you mean incredulity? No, it's not incredulity. <laughs> Come on. I don't want to have to say it. I want to see. Thank you. Ozian gets it right. Yes, Ozian is correct. Gold star for you, Ozian. Argument from ignorance, also known as argumentium ad ignorantium. When you hold a position to be true merely because it hasn't been demonstrated to be false or proven to be false, that is by definition textbook argument ad ignorantium. This is exactly what he did here. He's saying that God does not exist at all because he hasn't been demonstrated. Now, if you would have just kept the top part, there would be no, no issue there, right? If, if you want to say, look, you're asserting things that are not demonstrated, and I feel justified not to accept them. I'm justified to dismiss your claim. That's fine. Now, I wouldn't at all ever recommend dismissing something merely, merely because somebody has not demonstrated them. That is epistemologically untenable, Right? Because if, if I say A equals A and you say, well, you haven't demonstrated that, therefore I dismiss it, you're going to be irrational. One, you can't really demonstrate A equals A. It's A priori knowledge, right? It, it's not something that is empirical. It's not something that's scientific. It's not something that requires uh, any kind of, of demonstration. It is an axiom. It is a principle of logic, the law of identity. So if I say A equals A and you say, well, can you demonstrate that? And I say, well, no. And you say, well, then I don't believe you. You're being irrational, right? But the, to the evidential, evidentialist who just says, you know, you shouldn't believe anything without sufficient reason, then there's a, there's a difference there. That's somebody who says, look, I have sufficient reason to dismiss your argument, right? If I just say A equals A and I say I don't have evidence for it and you say you, you, you don't believe me, you don't have sufficient reason to dismiss it. Right? You don't have reasons to. You can't just say, well, you haven't demonstrated, therefore I dismiss it. That's not a reason to dismiss A equals A. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah, and Kimo Maki is true. You know, Kimo Maki is, you know, he does call it a fallacy. Yeah, and, and no true Scotsman, um, whether it's a fallacy or not, you know, I, I, the no true Scotsman to me is more a maneuver than a fallacy. I agree. And that, and Flew coin, you know, when Flew was talking about the no true Scotsman, um, you know, he, he did refer to it more as a maneuver, as, as, you know, almost similar to, it's not, but almost similar to moving the goalpost, but it's, it's, it's obviously not the same thing. Right, because he's like no true Scotsman would would ever do such a thing, right? But again, I think they're using the word fallacy in a very generalized, you know, usage, which is fine. If you want to call them call it the the no true Scotsman fallacy or the black swan fallacy, again, I'm not a prescriptivist. I personally don't think that really connotes what it, what a fallacy actually is understood to be in the literature. So I personally don't like the term fallacy attached to those. I, I just don't. But I, I don't really care one way or another. Nick says, so you got to believe anything anyone says or you're irrational. Is, is that what I said? Because I'm pretty pretty sure I can review this and, and go back because I, I don't think that's what I said. I don't think I said anything remotely like that. Where, where, did, where did that come from? Where, where did I say that, Nick Ross? Um, oh, wait, I didn't. Yeah, I never said anything of the sort. So your question is irrelevant because you can't ask a question on something that I didn't say. There's a fallacy for that, too, if you... Or trying to say that I say something I didn't say by trying to argue something that I didn't argue. That's called a straw man fallacy. I've never argued such a thing. So no, that is not what I'm saying. What I said was, if you want me to repeat it, is that you don't have to, you, you, if you don't accept something, there needs to be reasons for it. Right? You can't just say I don't accept what your, your claim is merely because you haven't demonstrated it. That's really not a great justification. Right? Because if I say I claim A equals A and you say, well, I, haven't, I don't believe anything that's not demonstrated, well, how, you can't demonstrate A equals A. Right? It doesn't mean you have to believe it. This means you don't have to accept it. Not accepting is not the same as believing that it's false or believing that it's true, right? I mean, not, there's a difference between not accepting and rejecting in philosophy. Rejecting means to hold false. It asserts the negation. Not accepting can either mean that you didn't um, believe the proposition or you hold the proposition false. So not accepting is the category. You either accept it or you don't accept it. If you don't accept it, it's because you just don't hold it true, or so you don't hold it false, or that you actually do hold it false. Does that make sense? But merely be, if you're not accepting, doesn't mean you don't hold the opposite position. This is exactly what that video was saying from Matt. Matt was explicitly saying this. If you don't hold something as true, if you don't accept it, it doesn't necessitate mean, or necess it does not necessitate or necessarily mean that you hold it as false. You just merely may not accept it, which is something that Matt was talking about, which is called agnostic, right? All right, so moving on to the next one. He says, the null hypothesis is that no God exists. Really, Matt? Can I get some citations on this? I've looked into this. I've looked into this extensively. And the only place I even see it talked about, you know, in general is like Encyclopedia Britannica, I think it was, and some other places that say atheists hold this and atheists say this. But in the literature, I could not find anything that actually really represents why the null hypothesis is that no God exists. There's no justification for that. And, and worse, the null hypothesis is a statistical inference. It's a statistical inference. It has to do with statistics and experimentations. Okay? This is philosophy. Philosophy is not necessarily an experimental science, right? It's, it's just not. It, 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 it delegates to science how you should do experiments. The scientific method is a philosophy. Scientific methodology is a philosophy. Methodological, um, methodological, um, uh, uh, um, uh, naturalist, you know, a, a methodological naturalist is a philosophy, right? But the null is basically saying, this is what I'm going to accept as true, for an observation, I'm going to do an experiment, I'm going to observe the experiment, and based upon my numbers, based upon the p-value, I'm going to see if I can reject the null as true and accept my explanation as being the case, as more likely the case, right? That's called rejecting the null. So you have to, re you have to do an experiment to reject that no god exists, and what, what would that experiment be, Matt? Um, and, and, the, and the theists can say the opposite. They can say, my null hypothesis is that God exists. And that they're going to do an experiment this, the, on observations and see if they can reject that null hypothesis to, to have the hypothesis that no God exists. 
right? Because right now, if the null hypothesis is no God exists, then the hypothesis is God exists, right? And I don't think even Matt would argue that if that's what he's using it. Then the hypothesis is God exists, the null is no God exists. But to a theist, it's the opposite. He would just say, look, the null hypothesis to me is that God exists, and I, I'm, try, I'm going to see if I can reject that to put forth my hypothesis that God exists. That's how it would work in, in statistical inference. Both coin, sides of the coin have a null hypothesis for their own personal views. And that, again, only works in statistical methodologies. It has nothing to do with philosophy. Matt, and every time I see a new atheist use this type of nomenclature, I think they're bastardizing not just philosophy, but science. Craig Reed, TRC, TCR. Hey, buddy, how you been, man? He says, LOL, the null hypothesis, I saw that absurd. But yeah, it's absolutely absurd. And yet, they keep on repeating this time and time again. Right? It's just, it's just, it, it's, it's, at this point, Matt's just lying. Sorry, Matt, you are lying. You've been explaining this numerous times. There are many, many people online that understand statistical inferences that have explained this. I've seen him do it. So I think he's just dishonest. Then he says, there is only theism and atheism. Again, he's been explained that is not the case. Now, if he were to say there is only theism and atheism as I use these terms in my schema, I cannot fault him for that because that would be a true statement. His schema is non nonsense to me, but it would be a true statement. But he's trying to normalize this as this is the case throughout, you know, like the literature, which is like ridiculous. This is like creationist level stuff. This is flat earth level stuff. This is like a creationist arguing that his view about kinds, right? Well, there's only kinds. There's no such thing as evolution, you know, and, and, and phylogeny. There's just kinds. Well, in his, in his worldview, that would be, that, you know, would be true the way he defines kinds, whatever he, you know, if let's say he defines kinds of species. Okay. So he says kinds don't interbreed. Okay. Well, that's true because species don't, you know, different Different kinds, I'm saying, different kinds don't interbreed. Okay, that's true because different species don't interbreed. And I'm not talking about hybridization. We're talking about biologically reproductively isolated species, right? So assume you have two populations that are biologically reproductively isolated from each other. They cannot mate and have offspring together, okay? The creation says we're different kinds. Okay, and, and, and here's vernacular. That's true. I don't have, I mean, whatever. Now, obviously, a creation is, a good, you know, then just kind of, it doesn't make any sense in the long run because I think they're just, you know, playing semantic games at that point. But this is what Matt's doing. He's doing the same thing. He's using his own personal schemas to say there's only theism and atheism. But that's not true. We know that's not true. We know this agnostic, which is neither theist or atheism in the academic literature, which is logically the case that many, many actual experts on these topics have written about. Right? Dr. Demi, Dr. McCormick, Dr. Draper, Dr. Um, Oppie, Dr. Demi, Dr. Bridget Guest Jackson, Dr. Rowe, Dr. Blackwell, Dr. Um, uh, was it uh, J uh, Smart, JJC J. Smart? Um, I believe wrote about it. Um, and even Martin, even Flew, even Smith, all of them have at least talked about it, right? So I, I cannot find a single solitary academic that agrees with this. Now. Martin Smith, Flew, and Boulevant, who happens to be a theist, all would prefer people use atheism this, in the sense that it is merely a lack of belief. But I've never seen any of them argue that in the academic literature, there's only theism and atheism. None of them. All four major advocates, and by the way, all of them are dead now, unfortunately. Um, Flew um, is dead. Smith passed away a few, not too long ago. I think like last year, wasn't it? It wasn't that long ago. I thought, I thought he had died a long time ago. I thought Smith was, I hate to say that, I thought Smith was, was long since dead, uh, but it wasn't that long ago. Uh, oh, no, Boulevant's not dead. I'm sorry. Boulevant's the only one that's not dead out of that four. <laughs> sorry, Boulevant. I didn't mean to, like, to, to say, put out an, um, uh, what is it that um, uh, was said, you know, the, the, the reporting of my demise have been greatly over-exaggerated, Mark Twain, something along those lines. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, this is just a false statement. Now, somebody could argue, well, according to, to his, his worldview, it's not false. Well, that's not what he's arguing, though. This is a categorical statement. This is something that is a declaration. There is only theism and atheism, and there's a period after it. There's no qualifiers. That is wrong. That is dishonest, because he knows better. 
And then he says, you are either convinced or not. That is true. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, nobody's going nobody's gonna to argue that. Period. Uh, well, yeah, again, uh, if you're aware of the proposition, right? You're not, a, well, I mean, even if you're, un, if you're unaware of the position, you're not. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not going so far to say if you're unaware of the proposition, you're not convinced because you're unaware, right? I mean, we went through that with the video. So, okay. But as far as the, there was only atheism or theism, period, that's wrong. Um, agnostic isn't some middle ground. Yes, it is, Matt. This has been explained multiple times. You've even talked about this on your own channels. You even have videos on this. It's about knowledge. No, not when we're discussing the ontological status of God. Once again, the term agnosticism has multiple usages in the literature. It's polysemous. The original usage for agnosticism was coined by Thomas Henry Huxley, and it was meant to represent a methodological approach to things, and it's a scientific method, so to speak. That basically one shouldn't accept something without, without scientific grounding, without scientific reasoning. It, it was very related to evidentialism and scientism in, in many ways. But that was a hundred some odd years ago. Nobody in modern times I, that I, I know of besides um, um, somebody on, on, on um, Twitter, what's his name? Um, uh, what's his name? He's, he's the only one that uses it still this way. You guys know who I'm talking about. He has a, the, the something agnostic. Oh, what is his name? Jeez, I, I've known him for a long time, too. And, and he has a PhD in some subject, too. But the annoying agnostic. What is his name? Um, uh, let, me, let me see here. Uh, I don't remember his name. You guys have to remind me. You, you, uh, you guys, you guys, I'm sure you, re you remember who it is. But um, he's the one that holds that position that he still uses as Huxley did. The other, the other thing is the the uh, um, uses of agnosticism in the epistemological domain, where it talks about the knowability of gods, which is a whole different ball game. But we're not talking about the knowability of gods. And by the way, it's not even about knowledge. Knowledge, when you talk about Gnosticism, it related to a very specific type of knowledge, hidden knowledge, divine knowledge, sacred knowledge. That was, if you are aware of this knowledge, you can become one with the gods. It was how to, to obtain divinity. It's not just explicit knowledge. It's not just tacit knowledge. It's not just a priori knowledge or a posteriori knowledge or procedural knowledge. It's none of that. It's not epistemological knowledge. This is equivocation fallacy. This is a misunderstanding of the word knowledge in how it's used polysemously in the literature. And so he's just trying to throw all these things together and it's wrong because you can't start off in the domain of theism and atheism. That domain is ontological. That's in the ontological and dosastic domain, meaning that it deals with the existence of God. Existence of God is ontological. Whether you believe or not is dosastic because dosastic deals with beliefs. Where is he getting knowledge from all of a sudden? And he says, which is a subset of belief, not a third option. But you see the error he's making here? You see the sophistry he's doing? Yes, knowledge is a subset of belief, belief, right? Knowledge is a subset of belief, but nobody's claiming knowledge is an option. He's saying not a third option. Who's saying knowledge is an option? Agnosticism is the third option of somebody who neither believes the proposition is true, theism, or neither believes the proposition is false, atheism. He's trying to change it and force fit it and shoehorn it into his own personal ideological usages, which I've shown numerous times have so many epistemic and logical issues. It's just rot with them. But here is he's outright being deceptive. He's saying it's about knowledge, which is a subset of belief, which is true, but not a third option. Well, nobody's making that claim that knowledge is the third option. What would that even mean? Well, what's your position, knowledge? What, what, the, what, the, what the hell does that mean? Air Church, have you debated Dillahunt at this point? I've discussed things with Dillahunty before on my channel, but he, he he won't talk about any of this stuff with me. Why would he? He knows he's. he's I I hate to say. I, I'm just going to to say it. I think he's outmatched. Um, not that I have some great insight on this, but I have the facts. I have the evidence. I have the logic. I have the reasoning. I have the documentation. Right. So it's not a matter of what I know. It's a matter of the evidence itself. And I don't think Dillahunty will go against anybody that can show that him be wrong because he's using sophistry. He's using dissonic tactics. The evidence speaks for itself, right? The evidence speaks for itself. You don't, you don't have to like me. You don't have to believe me. It doesn't matter. I just say go where the evidence is at, right? And if you go where the evidence, he's completely wrong. He's une 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 unequivocally wrong. Oh, shoot. I didn't mean to move that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um... Anyway, so, so nobody's claiming that knowledge is the third option. What would even make sense? 
If I, hey, Maki, you say, hey, what's your position on God? I say, knowledge. Oh, no, nobody's doing that. But if you say, I'm agnostic on it, everybody knows in the, in the, in the, in the field knows that means that you just don't have a position either way. Nobody's, nobody's relating that to knowledge because it's, it's silly to do that. That's not how the word agnostic is being used. If you read Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Dr. Draper's uh, paper, he makes it very clear that in modern times, the term agnosticism is understood as the state of being agnostic on the proposition, meaning you don't have a position either way. You're unconvinced. Oppie holds the same thing. So, you know, who, who is Matt trying to fool here? Oh, yeah, the people that, that believe him by fiat, that don't go look into literature and, and don't ask themselves, does this make sense? Right? I mean, I just literally had a blog from somebody that I, that I, I did a, um, a review on that just it blew my mind how, how god-awful it really was. But you know what? At least the guy tried. You know, an attempt was made. I'll give him props for that. And, he, and, and the guy just honestly made some massive mistakes, right? But uh, he, I don't think he's being sophistic. There's a difference. I, I think that that was a, a guy who just didn't understand my paper. He didn't understand the topic. He didn't understand the terminology. Um, I think it boiled down to him having a misconception about strong and weak classifications. He was, for some reason, trying to relate strong and weak to levels of confidence. Like... Um, you know, are you strong to believe something rather than, I weakly believe, right? That's what he was trying to relate it to. And that's not how those words are even remotely understood in the literature. The way a strong would mean, the strong case means that you have the negator on the, on the proposition rather than the predication. And weak means you have the, the negator on the, on the predication rather than the proposition. That's how it works. And he didn't understand that distinction, which means he was starting from like a completely different aspect of things. He, he was just out to lunch. He didn't understand the topic to even try to critique it properly because he didn't understand the way the, the terminology was being used, right? And, and, and that, that can happen, right? But then, oh, once, and by the way, once I pointed out to them, I haven't heard back from him. He just kind of stopped after that. Maybe he realized that you know, maybe he didn't um, have the grasp of the, of the paper that he thought he had, right, or, or the terminology. Um. Outdone says, I'm a few minutes behind. I think the Huxley agnostic guy on Twitter you are talking about is a militant agnostic. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Outdone. That is exactly who I'm thinking of. Hey, you, guys, you guys know this stuff. You guys, you guys keep me on the to toes. You guys. <laughs> I, I had a brain fart. I couldn't think for some reason, man. Um, all right. So, yeah, this is just sophistry. And then he says that violates excluded middle. What? What the hell does that guy do with excluded middle? Excluded middle. And, and again... Matt knows this. This is why I think he's just outright lying. The excluded middle is basically in classical logic that a proposition must be either true or false. There is no other prop, um, variable for it, right? Or no other truth, you know, truth value. Which is kind of funny because this is why he blocked me on Twitter a very long time ago. I was trying to explain multi-valued logics um, in that in a multi-valued logic system, you can have true, false, or unknown. So if you don't know about the proposition, you assign a truth value of U. It has three values, T for true, F for false, and U for unknown. And he was like getting on my case for it, going, oh, you know, you're going to be true or false. I'm like, dude, I'm not talking about classical logic. I'm talking about multi-valued logic. And I, and, I'm, and I do believe that Matt is, is not unaware there's many different types of logic. I mean, there's modal logic, there's epistemic logic, there's nostastic logic, there's uh, intuitionist logic, there's... Um, uh, propositional logic, sentential logic, classical logic, even though they, they overlap, right? A predicate, you know, predicate logic, there's a whole bunch of different logics, right? So, you know, I, first order lower logic, second order logic. I mean, I don't understand why he would, like, tell me I'm wrong about something when I'm not even talking about classical logic, right? But where does exclude a middle come in here? So what? Yes, the proposition is true or false doesn't mean you have to believe it's true or false. He even talked about in the video. You don't have to believe it's true or false. If you don't even said if you don't accept it as true, it doesn't mean you accept it as false. He was telling Clarence this. Okay. Then if you don't accept it as true and you don't accept it as false, you believe neither position, you are undecided, that is called agnostic in the literature. Ubiquitously. Ubiquitously is called agnostic on P. There's no other place I've ever found in any you can help you can help me go find it, but go find anywhere it says agnostic on P, they mean anything other than undecided. I've that exists, I've never seen it. I have never once seen agnostic on P not mean you don't have a position, true or false. What, what else would it mean? What would it mean? What would it mean to be agnostic on P in any other 
uh, context. What, uh, he says it's about knowledge. How? If I say I'm agnostic on the proposition, how am I telling you anything about knowledge? What is it telling you about my position about knowledge? Somebody help me. Somebody answer this question for me because I really swear to freaking God that may or may not exist. Don't understand how Matt, after all this time, thinks that he can put out this stuff and not be challenged on it and not have people tell him, you are lying at this point. You are absolutely lying, Matt. Because, and, and the excluded middle has absolutely nothing to do with it. Because all that's saying is that the, the, God, the proposition God exists is either true or false. If it's true, then theism is true. If it's false, then atheism is true. And the only way atheism can be true if it's propositional. And if it's propositional, that means that it has a truth value assigned to it, which means strong atheism. Only strong atheism, that he, that he refers to it as, can be true or false. Weak atheism or negative atheism cannot be true or false. It's non-propositional. And I have proven using logic that weak atheism is logically the same as strong atheism. Weak atheism is logically the same, same as agnosticism, which is logically the same as um, weak theism if you do not have a positive epistemic status. I prove this using logic. And you, you can go look at my timeline if you want to go see the, the proof. Um, and, I, and, and Graham Oppie noted it as well. He didn't prove it, but he noted it. He, he, he noted this, that they're synonymous, right? Um, but I happened to, to, you know, happen to like Oppie's work, and I read his work, and I was like, oh, you know what? Yeah, I, they are synonymous. Let's see if I can actually prove it, though, right? And I, and I, and I did prove it using a proof. And, I, and if I remember correctly, I actually checked the proof in a logic, prover, <laughs> logic checker. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think he's just, he's just being sophistic at this point, because what the hell has it got to do with the, the excluded middle? You know, he's doing, he's doing what theists do. He's just kind of like bamboozling people using philosophical terminology that he thinks is going to be impressive to the, the, his followers. But anybody who actually knows this stuff can, can look at this and go, there's so many things wrong in here. And I tested that hypothesis. I said to people on Twitter, how many things do you find wrong? I put it on Facebook. How many things you can find wrong? And there's like an average between five and seven things. Some of them may overlap. But there was, on the average, about six, five to seven major things that he got wrong here that they all determined. It wasn't just me. So that means to me that it's objectively wrong to a degree. Well, I'm not going to go to that extent. I can't say that it's objectively wrong. Um, I could argue that it's possibly objectively wrong which because other people have discovered it. I can't make the case that it is objectively wrong. That would be fallacious. But because other people have, have independently verified things, there's a case to be made that there are some objectively false statements in here, right? Like there's only theism and atheism. You can go verify yourself that's false, which means... It is, and that I will argue is objectively false. It is objectively false. There's no, there's no subjectivity to it, um, as stated. Now, one would argue, well, using his terminology is not false. Okay, but that's not what he's saying here. He's not saying from his position. He's making a categorical statement by no, having no qualifications. He's making a categorical statement, and that categorical, st categorical statement is either true or false. Categorically, that statement is false. There is only true, and think about this. There is only theism and atheism. Okay, by the way, it's, it should be or as a connector. There's either theism or atheism, but I'm going to let that one go. That's quibbling. I, I bet that's quibbling. But that statement is either true or false. If I have one defeater for it, it's false. And the defeater is, well, in philosophy, that's not the case. That's the defeater. That's why it needs to be qualified, and, and, and he doesn't do that here, which I think is being sophistic. All right. So let's get to the chat here. I went way longer than expected. I'm going to try to keep this down to an hour. Um, and then I am streaming tonight at midnight Eastern, 9 o'clock my time with Aaron from EKP People Suck. Um, and we're going to be showing emails from, um, from a very specific uh, situation on, on uh, YouTube that I have never released before. I kept them private for a very long time. Uh, I, well, I shouldn't say very long time. I only really discovered them a few months ago. They were in my spam folder. Um, but I, I, I received them. I, I don't know. It has been a month. Yeah, I mean, actually, yeah, it's about a month. But I kept them, I kept them private. They're, I actually, I received e emails for quite some time. Um, but the ones I want to show, I've only had for about a month. But uh, I have never made it public. And so I think that there's a reason to make them public, that if they help other people put things together, then it may be of, of value to them. And um, I, I, th I have to weigh the pros and the cons. But again, these are emails that are fake emails. They're, they're not from anybody specific, you know, they're not, they're, they are from somebody specifically, but they are fake emails. They're a person trying to set me up. 
and frame me. So let me be very clear. I'm not, I'm not exposing emails to me. I'm not, if you send me email, people know it's private, right? But these are fake emails that bounce back on a server that I, I got, came to my name that were set up. And you might be, if you guys are interested in that, then join me at midnight Eastern time. Um, all right, so let's go through these real quick and, and get it out of the way. Craig, TCR, by the way, i huge fan of your channel, my friend. Um, may not have to agree on all things, but I like your approach, as you know. He says, yeah, agnostic, plain and simple. The tweet was completely ignorant. I was shocked, actually. And you are not the only one. More and more people are coming to the realization that Matt is being dishonest, both theist and atheist, and they're sick of it. Because when Matt does that, he's making all non-believers look bad. Right, and I am, you know, helping out an organization called the Atheist for Liberty, um, working with Thomas Sheedy, uh, Matt, uh, uh, David Silverman is on the board. Um, they've had Michael Sherman on. I think he, I think he might be on the board too. And uh, uh, they've asked me to help them out on certain things. Um, I, I absolutely said sure. I like their their mission statements. I like what they have to offer. And they have I have written rewritten one of their pages, uh, understanding atheism. Um, and they are incorporating some of the things I wrote uh, and redoing their own, their web page uh, on that. It hasn't been done yet, but I appreciate the, that they wanted my input on it. Uh, so, you know, when people say, well, Steve doesn't support atheists. Well, no, I support honest atheists. I don't support dishonest atheists. Um, and, and Matt Dillahunty is a dishonest atheist. And by the way, he's not a fan of Atheist for Liberty. <laughs> and he's not a fan of Silverman, obviously. <laughs> We're not going to get into all that, but yeah, him and Silverman, not not friends of each other. Let's just put it that way. Uh, I, I, I don't even want to get in the drama on that. But there's and you, you guys may may or not know, but there's some major history there. And you know, I don't have to support David Silverman per se to to to, to agree. He's basically got screwed in some aspects. Um, and I definitely disagree with his his philosophy um, on uh, atheism. But you know, again, David Silverman has never been dishonest to me. He's never screwed me over. Um, Matt Dillahunty has been nothing but dishonest. And if you guys remember, Matt Dillahunty also supported Kyle um, and said that you know Kyle's ex-boyfriend was just a drunk ex and that the lawsuit came down to his word, um, which I find to be detestable because he never apologized for that. Right, so, um, which is personal, and I admit that, um, which is fine. Um, I'm allowed to have some personal views and some bias, but if he would have apologized for that, then it would have been water on the bridge, but he never has, right? Um, Craig TRCR says, yeah, weak atheism is similar to spiritual agnosticism. Yeah, logically, they're, I, they're indistinguishable from each other. Now, is there some epistemic issues with them? Sure. I, I mean, you, you can say there's some second order or some, some, uh, some epistemic differences between weak atheism and agnosticism. That's fine. But they're logically the same position. Just like Catholicism and Judaism are both theism. Logically, they're the same position. God exists, right? But epistemically, there's a difference between them. Not all... Theists are the same, right? So people that hold agnosticism, while logically they're a weak atheist, doesn't mean they accept that position because there might be some epistemic differences. I don't, I, I don't consider myself a weak atheist. I don't like the terminology. I don't think that it's applicable, right? But I am agnostic. But logically they're the same. Just like a Catholic says, I'm a theist, right? And, and a Jewish person says, I'm a theist. And they both are logically, you know, somebody who believes P. But they're not the same position. They're both somebody who believes P. Does that make sense? So there are differences between a weak atheist and an agnostic, but they are logically the same. I hope that makes sense because I, I mean, it should, right? People should agree that a, a, a Christian, a Catholic, a Jew, all believe God exists, but they are different positions within that. Um, John says, hi all, only an hour late. Got to watch from the beginning though. So going back to the start, this should be fun. Well, when you catch up to this part, uh, welcome, John. Always a pleasure having you around. I appreciate all the support you've given um, and the support that you've given Aaron as well. I've noted that as well. Uh, even though I have not been online as much as I was before because I am working and I got real life stuff to do, um, I do try to pay attention to, to certain things. And, and yes, John, I've been definitely paying attention to your support across the board. And I've noted that. Thank you. Uh, Skeptic77 says, are you agnostic about being wrong? Um, no, he's wrong. <laughs> He's wrong. Um, outdone. It's funny because agnostic is commonly used in common parlance to mean undecided. Yes. Matter of fact, SCP notes that. He's like, they're like, you know, it says that agnostic is used, you know, in and out of philosophy to represent undecidedness. You know? Also, you know, what, what does it mean to be agnostic on something? 
You're not. If I just say I'm agnostic on something, does that tell you my position relating to knowledge? No, of course not. Right? And 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 Matt won't answer those questions. If he says agnostic to knowledge, okay, I'm agnostic. What does that mean? Tell me. Tell me what that means, Matt. In, in your uses, is what, what do you think it means when I'm saying that I'm agnostic in your schema? Now you know he knows what it means in my schema, right? That's why I think he's being dishonest. Matt knows when I say I'm agnostic, he he knows it means I'm just undecided whether God exists or not, right? It is, it is true God does exist or God does not exist, right? And it is true that I don't believe God exists, but that doesn't by necessity make me an atheist. That's where he goes wrong. He's trying to say by necessity if you don't believe you're an atheist. That's a semantic BS game. That is dishonest. That is everything that I, I, I have stood for for, what, six years against the new atheist diatribe? But I absolutely support honest atheism. That's why I've been working with atheists for, for liberty. This is why I actually like the Satanic Temple. This is why I like Lucine Greaves. I've just talked to him the other day. Um, so, you know, I have nothing against, you know, atheism and sat Satanism for people who say there are no gods. But do so just, you know, justify it. Be honest. That's perfectly fine. It's not that hard to justify. But Matt believes there are no gods. But then he retreats back to this, oh, I don't believe. And then he wants everybody else to try to accept his schema. Even though it's wroth, like I said, it's wroth with, with, with freaking um, issues. So, uh, Kimaki says, atheists are non-believers. Yeah. Well, non-believers of God exist, right? Theists are non-believers as well. In, in, in that, theists do not believe that God does not exist, right? Now, I understand what you mean by it, shorthand, and, and nothing wrong with that. When I say atheists are non-believers, yeah, I mean the same thing as you do, Maki. But for every belief position, there's a non-belief position. For every believing P, there's a non-belief of not P. So if I say I believe X equals X, it means that I do not believe that X does not equal X. So, yes, theism, theists are non-believers as well of the proposition of atheism. So he, does, he, doesn't, he doesn't allow for those types of, of logical distinctions. He doesn't allow for, for anybody to be other than theist or atheist, which, again, he's just saying, well, an atheist is non-belief. Well, but the theist can do the same thing. The theist can turn around and say, well, okay, um, a theist is anybody who doesn't believe that God does not exist. That's the wasp argument. And if you don't allow it, that's special pleading, which is the wasp argument, which he's never defeated, by the way. That, my wasp argument has been, well, since what, 2018, 2019? It's never been defeated. So, uh, just demonstrating that my firm grab of the obvious. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's so funny. It's obvious to you and I, and it's obvious to most of my listeners, and it's obvious to people that know the topic. That's what I'm saying. I no longer accept the, the principle of charity from Matt that he just doesn't understand. I think it's just outright deception at this point. I, I really honestly do. He has to know he's lying to people and does not care. Uh, it's pure, uh, uh, unmitigating sophistry. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, I'm going to prepare for the other stream tonight, but I also want to um, go eat before then. I want to leave one thing before I do. I think it's this one. Let me. Nope. Well, this is good enough. This is good enough for now. It's actually 0.5, but this has actually changed. I don't have the latest. You can go look for see the latest and update it, but check this out. My paper has only been out a couple of days. And in those couple of days, it has reached uh, over 400 views and is in the top 1% of all papers read on the, on the site. It's actually in the top 5%, I just looked. Top 5%, point, top 0.5%, sorry, top 0.5%. That to me is pretty impressive. Most papers don't get that, especially from somebody who's not even academic, right? I mean, I can't imagine, you know, every paper that, that you know, put up on the site gets that many people reading it. Because I don't even have, I didn't even have followers the other day. I only had like, I think one follower, I think like six now. But that is getting some traction. Do you, do you think that Matt Dillahunty is ever going to address it? Hells no. Hells no. Hang on, hang on a second. Uh, sorry, I had to sneeze there. Um, and I muted my mic. Uh, but, yeah, he's never going to address it. Why can't? I would love to see Matt Dillahunty try to review my paper. I'd love to see Arn Ra try to review my paper. I'd like to see what they say on it. Because the last guy to try to review my paper bastardized it so badly. So badly. I mean, I mean, here, look. 
here, here's let me show you this. This is, this is gonna love this. This is, this was my Venn diagram that my my work is based upon, and is the Venn diagram that um, I came up with, and that Lana Kurt Noll helped me with the legend to make sure that it was um, easily digestible, right? So this is my Venn diagram, right? That if you go to you read my paper, it would all follow along with this. Uh, the only difference is that in my paper I use G instead of prop for P, right? G is a proposition God exists. The reason I do that is because that's what Dr. Burgess Jackson and Dr. Demi uses. And I added an S for subject because it's a little more formal. Uh, BP is a little more informal. BSP or ABSG is a little more formal because you're talking about a subject. Or you can use A for agent. It's indexical. So I use their nomenclature. And, and personally, like I said, I use BP and B not P. If it's very, very simple. I'm trying to relate to concept. If I want to be a little more formalized, then I use the S for subject or I use the A for agent. Um, and then, like I said, G is just means the proposition of God exists. Now, comparatively speaking, comparatively speaking, this was his Venn diagram. And I want to see what you guys think, if you guys can maybe see a difference. And then he was saying, well, I didn't really mean it as a Venn. I'm like, what the hell did you mean it as then? I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I got to find it. It's lost, lost here somewhere. Here we go. Um, this was his. This was his. You ready for this? If you guys didn't see my 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 name earlier, that was his. What? <laughs> it's like what is this? What is this mess? You know, and he, and he did say he initially did say it was a van, and I'm like, okay, so what's the green circle? And he labeled A as strong atheism and B as strong theism. So. Anybody in C, which is the intersection of A and B, is both a strong theist and a strong atheist? How does that work? How, how, how does this work? Right? And then the other, the other image you came up with um, was this. Find this one. Uh, this was the other image you came up with. And I'm like, I don't understand what this is supposed to be saying here. I, I, I really couldn't grasp it. Um, and maybe that was just my part. I, no, I don't think it is. But I mean, and, and he calls it a Venn, right? These are called Venns, filler Venn. You know, he calls these a Venns. I, I, I don't know how, what's this supposed to mean here, right? I've never seen a bisection like this on a Venn like that. Um, so I'm really confused. But of course, like I said, he thought he refuted my, my, my paper. All right, going through here. Um, uh, Jim, Jim says, it's tough because obviously I spent 99% of my life using colloquial uses of the word, agnost uh, word gnostic, which clearly is yours, but I was changed to Matt's subjective description of atheist. I like it, but I like you as a person much better as him, Steve. I just haven't been able to go back since the using of ACA's description of atheist. Um, I'm simply more comfortable with it, and it resonates with me more to call myself an atheist because I'm not a theist. And by the way, Jeff, you can, nobody says you can't do that. Right? I'm not a prescriptivist. But I want people to understand the ramifications if you do, right? The, the epistemological and logical implications of that, right? Because by doing so, you've subsumed your you know, atheism. But you, you and I may have the same position. We're just calling it differently at that point, which is confusing. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm an agnostic. You're an atheist, but neither of us have a positive epistemic status, supposedly, which is confusing. Unless the enemy of you do, right? Jim says, it seems like you have a resentment towards people like me who just simply do not feel obligated to adopt a burn of proof as an atheist. And yeah, uh, some not a resentment, but I think it's dishonest because anybody, anybody with a position has a burn of proof. I mean, even Michael Martin, who advocated for negative atheism in his, his, his book, Negative Atheism, he, he says, look, even, even if you don't accept something, you have a burden to explain why. That's a burden of proof. Right? If you say, I don't believe you, okay, Why? And if you say, well, I don't have any reason to, then you're irrational. This is something that Matt Dillahunty has never properly explained, nor, nor, nor has R and Raw. If you don't accept something, yes, you have a burden to justify that. That's called the burden of proof in epistemological terminology. Right? You can't just say, I don't accept A equals A, because you didn't demonstrate it. If I say, why don't you believe A equals A? Well, because I don't like it. That's not, a, that's not a justification. That's not a rational justification. 
But Jim, let me ask you though: Do you have a positive epistemic status? I mean, do you hold the Erno gods? Uh, outdone. This guy's basically trying to get trying to draw a custom diagram to describe his uses. There's no logic to it. It's just a picture version of his definitions. But underneath it says Ven. It, it literally says Ven at the very bottom. Uh, let me see if I can blow this up. You see that right here? V filler Ven. Right? So. Uh, Patagia2679. That's a, that's a new name. Welcome. Uh, he says, if A is strong atheist and B is strong theist, then C is neither, not leaning to one side or the other. It's, it's the middle ground. No. Look at the Venn diagram. A Venn diagram is the intersection there, right? Let me pull up his diagram again. One second. So here's his diagram. Um, the, it, again, what he's he's trying to label the sections, and that's that's not how you do a van. You label the circles, right? He's trying to say everybody, everything in A is this, but that means that A is not just that crescent there. It's everything in the blue circle. It's everything in the blue circle. And everything in B would be in everything in the black circle, which means that C overlaps. That's the, called the intersection between A and B, right? So I, I, I just don't understand the, ter the usages here. Um, Jim says, no, I don't hold there as no gods. I literally have never been convinced and could never be convinced. Uh, either way, you, can't, you, you can never be convinced there's no gods? Or, I, mean, I mean, so if... There's no reasoning that can, that can, that can, to you, Jim, ever convince you that there's no such thing as gods. Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm just curious. I'm not, like, I'm not, I'm not being belligerent with you, man, at all. You know that. I really am honestly, honestly asking. Are you saying there's no evidence that can convince you there's no gods? Um, Kim Maki says, uh, once a prima facie case is made for proposition is made, a burden of justification shifts to the other party. And I agree with that. That's called the burden of defense at that point or the burden of refutation or the burden of rejoinder. Again, things that Matt never explains to people. You never hear Matt explain burden of, proper, burden of proof properly to anybody. I've never heard him say it. Has, has anybody ever heard uh, Matt Dillahunt even utter things like burden of persuasion? Burden of defense, burden of rejoinder, burden of refutation, burden of, pr of production, burden of, um, uh, or epi epi you know, even discursory burdens or evidential burdens or epistemological burdens. Has anybody ever heard Matt ever talk about any of those things? I certainly haven't. So yes, once you have, once you have, especially when you've made a case for something, the burden of justification shifts to the defendant. Right? That's called the burden of refutation. There's a name for it. Even in a court of law, which people like using those analogies, which is not analogous. There's, there's literally no analogy to be made there. But let's go with it. It's a really bad, poor analogy. But if the prosecution is making their case, you don't think the defendant just sits there and does nothing? You think their defense lawyer does nothing? No. The, 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 the defense lawyer has an onus to put a defense on for the, his client. It's called the burden of defense. <laughs> I mean... Yes, the state has to reach a certain level to make their argument to show that the, the, the defendant is guilty, sure. But you can't just say that the, the defendant has no burden. Yes, they have a burden. They have the burden to, to make sure the prosecution proves their case. <laughs> right? This is where Mike and the rest of New Atheists get very confused. The defense has a burden of proof called a burden of rejoinder or burden of defense that the prosecution has to make their case. They cannot just sit there and do nothing. This is lazy thinking. And I think Matt is lazy when it comes to burden of proof on this. I think that he's lazy intellectually when he's trying to put out there the atheist, you have no burden of proof. You are lazy and you're dishonest when it comes to that. Um, Jim says, I don't have a burden of, of a lot of things, though. I, do, though. Do I really have a burden of proof to be agnostic on pure, purple evidence? Yes, you do. You need to have a burden of proof of why you, you are agnostic on the proposition of purple elephants. I hope purple elephants don't exist. And I'm not talking about taking an elephant and you know, painting it purple, right? But you know, if you want to pull, you know, pull this like invisible purple elephants, they don't exist. I'm not agnostic on that. But if you are agnostic, I'd like to know why. Are you not, if somebody says I'm agnostic on Santa Claus, yeah, I'd like to know why. What's your justification not to accept Santa does exist? Because I, I find that to be kind of weird if you're over six. 
So yes, you have a burden of proof on that. Absolutely. Um, Abdon says, yeah, but he clearly doesn't realize he could be could could have put into the van. That's why he's making them so weirdly. Yeah, might be, might be. Every by the way, everybody's that everybody that knows philosophy that have literally degrees in the subject matter has been explained to him how off it is, and he's very defensive. But after I explained to him that I think his misconception is that he doesn't understand what strong and weak means in the literature, because that's what he's trying to use. Um, he he has backed off a little bit. We'll, we'll see though. We'll we'll see. Um, I, by the way, go watch my last video. I'll put it in the ending of this video so people can go right to it. But I, I did analysis on his blog, which by the way, by the way, I admit I pressed that he, at least he tried. It's more than most people. He actually wrote a blog on my paper. Props to him, right? He, it's all messed up, <laughs> but certainly more than most people did. Um, Jeff says, no, I don't think you're being belligerent. Cool, thank you. Uh, well, I just don't know what evidence would be because i never seen any. Well, You've never seen evidence like Mackie puts out or Oppie? I mean, go, go read a book. I uh, highly recommend it. It's not an easy read, and I haven't read the whole thing, but I've read lots of it, called The Miracle of Theism by, by, by um, Mackie, uh, G.L. Mackie. It, it's, it's well, I mean, it has, like, every argument one way or another um, on, um, um, on one way or another for, for atheism or for theism, right? So it's called The Miracle Theism by J.L. Mackey. It, it is the canonical book of, of argumentation there, uh, against God and, and for God, one way or another. Now, he was an atheist, obviously. Mackey was an error theorist. But, um, yeah, he's a lot of good arguments against the existence of God. Oppie has a really good one, too, that I, I kind of labeled uh, appeal to theoretical virtues. I don't think Oppie ever, Oppie ever labels it as such. I have never asked him. Um, I did ask him to review my paper, which he hasn't got back to me on. Um, but uh, he does have an argument that it is doesn't appeal to theoretical virtues to posit a deity. And so he's arguing more naturalism, saying naturalism is more parsimonious, and that the positing of a supernatural being is not natural, is not harmonious with what we understand for having theoretical virtues, which is simplicity. Um, uh, what's some of the other theories? Uh, let, let me look these up so I can tell you what they are. Um, theoretical virtues are generally um, testability, empirical accuracy, simplicity, unification, consistency, coherence, and fertility. Right. So those are the canonical um, standard theoretical virtues, and and Oppie appeals to those, saying philosophical naturalism, not just methodological naturalism, but philosophical ontological naturalism, appeals to those. You can test things, right? You can have empirical accuracy of things. You can have coherence of the model. You can have simplicity of the model. But you can't have that with God. God doesn't meet any of those criteria, those criteria right? You got tests for God. God's not a simple explanation. <laughs> if anything, it's more complicated. Um, uh, and so that's, that's Oppie's argument. And because of that, he'll, he'll argue that the probability of, of a God existing is so low to warrant justification of believing there are no gods. Um, let's see here. Um, Pangita says, I think it's a poor diagram to express his point, but I think that's what he's trying to show, just a guess, maybe. Jim says, I appreciate the back and forth. It's very honest of you, man. Appreciate it. Um, they don't have to prove innocence. They merely have to refute the prosecution. Well, yeah, but that's why, you know, uh, the paper, the presumption of atheism by flu in 1972 was not accepted for that because they don't have, they don't have to prove innocence. Sure, but they still have a burden. Right, you cannot say that you you don't you cannot have a rational position without a burden of, pro, of proof. Right, if you a burden of proof just means in this case in the epistemological sense that you have a justification for your belief. That's all. How do you know they don't exist? He asked. Um, but I'm not. See, but Jim, see what you did there. You moved it from dosastic to an epistemological knowledge claim. Right. I know P is not the same as I believe P. I know P entails I believe P. Right. Or. I know not P in this case, and I believe not P, but I, I never claim that I know not P. When I say that I believe something, that's not a knowledge claim. If I say purple flying elephants don't exist, that's not a knowledge proposition or knowledge predication. That is a dosastic statement, right? If I say A equals A, that's assumed to be dosastic in nature in propositional logic. It's never assumed to be a knowledge claim. Because um, epistemologically speaking, knowledge is a very specific thing, right? It's, if you ascribe it to be um, what is necessary for, for knowledge to be the three elements of 
you believe it to be true, it is true, and you're justified to believe true, then that's the canonical relationships under justified true belief, which is most commonly the theory of knowledge. Um, Patagia says the defense is supposed to shoot holes in the prosecution case. That's the burden. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah, absolutely. That's what a good burden of rejoinder would be, right? Hey, you're saying this is the case. Well, let me let me show you why it's not. Right? And that's what did you want that for atheist? Don't you want the atheist going, hey, theist, you're saying this is the case. <laughs> let me show you why it's not. That's what I did on Agree to Argue. When I was on that show, Agree to Argue, for that one year, I was poking holes into theist arguments. Right? And I'm not even an atheist and I was doing that. So why would you not want the burden of proof? Why would you not want to poke holes in the theist argument? It just seems weird to me that somebody wouldn't. Jim says, maybe there's a purple evidence somewhere. How can you prove there isn't? I, I never said I couldn't prove there isn't. But things are so improbable. Why would you want to bloat your ontology? Right? Why would you want to bloat your ontology with something so improbable? And if you find out that there is a purple elephant, black swan, right? Then you just change your beliefs. You just have belief revisionism. You just revise it and go, oh, crap. Okay, I was wrong. I have a new belief. I wrote an essay called The Principle of, Retro uh, Principle of Attribution and Retraction that you may want to read. Jim, you might want to find it interesting. Um, uh, I will, I'll put in the, in the link in the, in the live chat now. But it's called, I call it the principle of attribution and retraction. Um, when you have a belief that's changed and you have a revision of your belief block box, you just change your belief. Knowledge cannot be false. I cannot change um, my revise knowledge. I have to retract my claim to knowledge. So when you, when you attribute something, like an epistemic disposition of knowledge of something, I don't say uh, my knowledge was false. I would say I did not have proper justification to claim knowledge. So I retract that claim. But if you have a false belief, you'd immediately say, yeah, my belief was false. Okay, so if there's a purple elephant, yeah, my belief was false. So what? Move on. I'm not afraid of being wrong. Jim says, I have a bachelor's in philosophy, by the way. And that's awesome, by the way. Um, um, so you, you might have already, the, you know, the necessary precursors to, you know, <laughs> read this stuff and go, yeah, you know, Stephen has a good point. Um, of course, you know, philosophy is a big subject, right? So there's a lot of different areas in philosophy. I'm not sure what your bachelor's is in. But yeah, you clearly have an, an aptitude to understand this, clearly, right? You have the prerequisites for it, and I, I, that's awesome. Uh, Connor B says, Cambridge Elements in Atheism and Agnosticism is an excellent introduction to that easy to digest. Very much so. Uh, Cambridge Elements, Atheism, uh, Agnosticism, written by Graham Oppie, is a wonderful book. It used to be free on Cambridge. I don't know if it still is, but you still find the DV, uh, uh, PDF out there somewhere. somewhere. But yeah, it used to be something that Oppie gave out to people. But, but um, it's a very good, uh, very good book. I wouldn't even call it a book. It's not that big, right? Um, Jim says, but there might be a God. Okay, so what? So what? We're not dealing with... As Russell pointed out in Propositions, right, on Propositions, I think it was, why would you want to bloat your ontology? Just because you, why would you, just because you might be something, because it's logically possible, doesn't mean you give you sufficient warrant to deny something, right? There, it might be possible that pigs fly out of my ass and spit silver dollars in a minute from now. That is logically possible, but is it metaphysically possible? No, right? And it, do I have reason to believe that's not going to happen? Yes. So in the proposition, pigs will fly out of my ass and spit silver dollars. I hold that proposition false, but they might. <laughs> okay, so what? If and when that does happen, guess what I do? I'll say, oh, my belief was false. I changed my mind. <laughs> I'm now convinced that pigs can fly out of your ass and spit silver dollars. That's all. Right? Uh, Baron Von Brass. Hey, Brass. How you doing, Mr. Brass, buddy? He says, I am glad to get, and try to get people books on atheist arguments against God. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Jim says, I don't know. I literally, literally have no clue. Well, like I said, think about it this way. What are you convinced of? Are you convinced that pigs won't fly out of your ass and spit silver dollars? I certainly am. And if I'm convinced, that means I believe. Right? I believe that that won't happen. I'm not agnostic on that proposition, even though it might happen. Well, what's the difference between that and God? Now, Obviously, I am agnostic on God, and there's many other reasons for it. But to, a, to an atheist, right, if I put my atheist hat on, the atheist says, yeah, I believe there's no God. Well, there might be. So what? Okay. And when, 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 when I am shown there's a God, I'll change my position. Right? I'm allowing there might be a God. Right? I'm not categorically saying 
gods are impossible. That's a, that that would be a hell of a burden, right? To the atheist, an atheist would say, uh, "The atheist says there is impossible of gods." I think they're out to lunch because I don't think there's a way to justify that. Certain types of gods, maybe, right? You know, maybe an inconsistently logical god, sure, right? Um, but an atheist can perfectly well say there are no gods, and it's told there might be. That's just called being. That's just understanding modal logic, right? Possibilities. Um, uh, Cafe said, hey, how you doing, my friend? He says, Dylan Hunty just posted a video on this Atheist Debates YouTube channel titled Frank Turek is wrong about the burden of proof earlier today. Really? Don't make me do another one. Stop. I'm not, I, look, I'm not a fan of Frank Turek. Frank Turek is, 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 is just as sophistic and, and dishonest as Matt Dylan Hunty is only on the theist side, right? And, and Matt, Frank Turek absolutely uses sophistry. So I don't know what that, that um, video is about. Do you, do you think I should review it? Let me know. Jim says, yes, the defense does have some burden in a courtroom. Absolutely, yeah. Literally called the burden of defense. Um, Jason says, uh, is God falsifiable? I, I, who knows? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, it depends with God, right? Certain gods are falsifiable. Um, if you say, you know, that God can create a square circle, I'm going to say that's falsified because it's logically impossible. Is the is the Christian God Yahweh that's has omni qualities but cannot do things that are logically inconsistent? Is that falsifiable? I don't know. I I'm, I'm I lean I'm lean toward no towards no, but falsifiability isn't the be all end all. Falsifiability really only applies to to theories, and even then, there's something called holistic confirmationalism or confirmational holism, right? Confirmational holism or holistic confirmation is the principle that even if you have a falsification criteria, there are usually escape hatches that can be implemented in a theory to account for it. So falsification that Popper you know, promoted isn't really the be-all, end-all. It's nice to have. I'm not going to say otherwise. But a lot of scientists I've read don't really subscribe to falsificationism. So in philosophy, though, it's irrelevant. I mean, falsification, again, goes to science. It goes to testability. Philosophy, who cares? The God of falsify or not doesn't matter. I mean, look, right now, aliens are, are aliens falsifiable in theory, right? If you, you went to every place in the universe and you found no aliens, would you say it's falsified? Yeah, but you look under that rock, you look under that rock, you know, so who cares about falsification, right? Right now, aliens are not falsified, can be falsified one way or the other. We don't have the technology to falsify whether aliens exist or not. But people believe aliens exist. You know, I believe there's you know extraterrestrial life somewhere out there. It just seems to be inevitable. I don't care whether it's falsified or ball or not. It's not. It's irrelevant to me. It's not. A, it's not a property that I care about. Philosophically speaking, it, excuse me. It's nice to have it in the scientific context, but even then, because of confirmational holism, it usually has it usually has very little value. Um, that repeat that paper name. Uh, the principle of attribution and retraction. Um, Jim says um, true I like that point there's nothing wrong with changing your claim yeah absolutely Just well a lot of people don't like to be seen false this is why I think that it goes to egotism with Matt Matt is an egotist and as such he's afraid to admit when he's wrong on something of this consequence he'll do it on little stuff right and so are Matt so are Aaron Ra but Aaron Ra has told me if I'm right then his entire life's work is for naught his words his words not mine his life's work is is you know for nothing if i'm right his words he's told me this which i think hyperbolic as hell but they would never admit that i'm right because it would it would it would just obliterate their falling with new with new atheist tm it would it would be a shock to their ego more than anything who cares if they lost following i don't i lose following all the time i don't care <laughs> i've lost hundreds of subs i don't care it, it, those are not the people that i want around because most of them were just not intellectually honest people um so he i think i think to him though his ego is related to his subs his ego is related to people that worship the ground he walks on and so i think that really would hurt his, hurt his ego having to recognize that my paper makes sense and that all this time about him promoting this theism and atheism stuff he's 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 dishonestly doing so because you never hear him say, well, yeah, it's Steve's scheme or the way Steve explains philosophy, Steve's right. If you want to go learn philosophy you know, of this particular 
stuff, go go listen to Steve. He'll never say that. He'll never say that. Uh, Cafe says, uh, it makes no sense to falsify that which is understood to be necessarily true. Yeah, you can't, <laughs> right? Uh, if it's necessarily true, you can't falsify it, right? Like X equals X or A equals A, it's true by necessity. I cannot be wrong on that. There's no way you could be wrong. It, it cannot be falsified. Um, Baron says, well, pigs could fly out of your ass. Plenty of people have said you pull things out of your ass. It's usually just arguments, though. Yeah, but hey, yeah, well, you know, maybe there's some concreteness there. Maybe there's some hyperstantiation, it's called, uh, taking some kind of, of, of concept and, 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 and reify it, it, it as to some kind of uh, substance, right? Reification fallacy, if you're familiar with that. So, yeah, it's possible. Um, get real. Uh, I have found a quote defin- defining atheism in the negative sense published 10 years before Huxley published his definition on agnosticism. So not sure why people think AE's usage is new. Well, it's not that it's not that it's not new. It just wasn't really utilized that much outside of, um, uh, uh, in philosophy. Outside, yeah, I mean um, Von Baron, uh, Holst, whatever, Holstrom or whatever, he kind of went that way. Um, nothing's, nobody's saying that atheism wasn't used negatively uh, outside of philosophy, but I think Flew really wanted to change that. And Huxley, Huxley didn't really have a position on it either way as far as, as that, that I can ever find. His, his position was that he felt the theist and atheist, as understood in philosophy, which would be the belief that, that God exists and the belief that God does not exist, he didn't have a position that represented him. That's what he called agnosticism. Um, Yeah, I, the atheist is not. Yeah, I'm familiar with that quote. Um, the atheist does not say there's no God, but that again um, was just an opinion, right? That doesn't that doesn't mean that's not how it was in philosophy. That's the point, right? You see the difference? Because I'm talking about normative the- the philosophical concepts, right? So when um, when, the, when when the quote by um, uh, uh, Brad, what is it, Brad, whatever. Uh, he's, you know, basically says the the atheist does not say there's no God, but says I don't, I know, I don't know what you mean by God. I am without idea of God, which is atheism, by the way. The word God to me sounds conveying no clear distinction affirmation. This is just his opinion of what atheism is, right? He's just basically saying I don't. I, I, this is not how it is because I just hold that, uh, that God has no meaning, right? But that's not how it is in philosophy. Brad laugh, yeah. Um, the Bible, you know, he says the Bible God I deny and the Christian God I disbelieve in, meaning that he believes are false. But I'm not rash enough to say there's no God as long as you tell me you're unprepared to find God to me, which is, again, dealing with ichtheism. So, yeah, that's just his opinion, right? Um, it has nothing to do with how the philosophy normative usages were. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm well familiar with it. I'm familiar with that, that get real, but that is, again, what he's saying. That's just his personal belief back in 1864, and he's trying to, to explain ichtheism. That's all. That's not how it is philosophy, though. Even in 1864, that's not normative. Atheism, normatively, even in 1864, if you, if you go back and read the literature, well, held that atheism was the positive epistemic status. So if you're going to quote mine, at least, you know, recognize that, you know, it's a quote mine, because you're not, you're not countering anything that I've said. Um, Jim, don't believe them. I find them valid, witness, uh, whereas there is no valid argument for purple elephants flying out of your house. Well, yeah, maybe not. I mean, but don't you believe that that's not going to happen? Do you, do you believe that they won't fly out of my ass? I, I believe they won't fly out of my ass. Do you, Jim, do you believe that pigs won't fly out of my ass, even though it's possible? Pigs flying out of my ass and spit silver dollars. Yeah, you got to get it right. And fart rainbows. We're going we're gonna to make it very specific. <laughs> Do you believe that it's not going to happen that right five minutes from now, pigs are going to fly out of my ass, spit silver dollars, and fart rainbows? And by the way, somebody who has, has more creativity in the mind can make a diagram of that, a picture of that, and, 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 and donate it to, to, to me. Um, I'd be greatly appreciative of that. If not, I'll work on something. Maybe I can create such a, such a thing. <laughs> you know. But if you're an artist and you want to like help the channel... Um, because the last person I had that artistic, did artistic work turned out to be not so honest. Um, let me know. I would appreciate it because I'm not really good at that kind of stuff, but I could try. But I would like to see a, 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 a picture of me with a flying pigs flying out of my ass while they're spitting silver dollars and farting rainbows because that would be really awesome.
Let's see here. Um, yeah, I remember the uh, Gabriel says a book from a plea for atheism. Yeah, I don't remember the source, but yeah. Um, can you prove God cannot change logic? Nope. Um, but it would be incoherent for me to have such a God, right? It'd be incoherent to posit a God that can change laws of logic. That does, it would be nonsensical to me. In fact, it was a theist that actually posited that years ago. They said, hey, can, if God is all-powerful and everything, can he cease to be? They said, well, no, God has to exist because, you know, he sustains everything. God is everything. God made everything. He, he can't just will himself out of existence. So they, they, they came up with what's called the principle of etern eternal verities, certain truths that are eternal. So the principles of, of eternal verities were certain things are always true, and God's existence is always true, and, and that God cannot do things that are illogically contradictory. Any theoretical God that could not exist, that is, yeah, well, no, and again, it was, the, it was a theist that, that posited that, said, well, how do we have that? How, how can, can, how, if God's all-powerful, he could cease to be. Well, no, he can't, you know. Get Real says, philosophers would call American atheists agnostics because they defined it negatively on the website. Well, American atheists are dishonest organization. We, we already know they're, they're dishonest, right? Uh, Pam Whistler from American Atheist, who's their editor, had told me, hey, Steve, um, American Atheist is a political organization. We're trying to get people to subscribe to us. We're not interested in philosophy. Tell atheists that are using American Atheist as a philosophical source not to do it, which I, I do to this day. Um, they're not interested in philosophy. They're not interested in being right, uh, philosophically speaking. They're only interested in getting members. So... Oh, man, I got another stream to do tonight, and my voice is already getting shot, so I had to wrap this up and let it rest. <clears throat> uh, but Jim says, Steve, I'm sorry because you've probably done this a million times, but can you put in a short statement as possible why it's important to you not to adopt the burden of proof as an atheist? I can't imagine why it would be important. Uh, why would you not want to adopt the burden of proof? All atheists should have a burden of proof. Even Richard Carey agrees with me in his blogs that atheists have a burden of proof. His argument is just that atheist has met it, and he's trying to relate atheism as, as like a scientific claim, which is a category error that Richard Carey makes. Dr. Um, Malpass and Ozzy noted the same things to, to, to Richard Carrier that he makes, I think, a fundamental mistake there. He agrees that burden of proof is something that atheists do have and should have, but his argument has already been made, met, just like a scientific theory has met their burden of proof. So when you say, like, evolution is wrong, and somebody counters, well, if evolution is wrong, you have the burden to show that it's wrong. That is true, right? In science, that is absolutely something I agree with. But that's not how it works in philosophy. Nowhere in philosophy has been proven, you know, or determined, or shown that uh, God does not exist. Therefore, you cannot make that, that analogy there. You, they, they're, they're, they don't relate to each other. So I think it's important that atheists have a burden of proof. If not, then their position is not rational. Uh, and it's not that hard to meet. I know many people that are atheists that met the burden of proof. It's not difficult. Al Dunn says, I'm saying it. I've, I've always understood atheism to mean the position there are no gods. Most people that live outside of America hold that same position. It seems to be only in America, really, that I find atheists that hold to some other position. Um, even before I learned philosophy, I've always, until recently, heard it used that way. Yeah, well, you know. I, I, are, you, are you from America? <laughs> I don't remember where you're... You know, but it's only, I should say it's only local pockets in like the southern Bible Belt in Texas I find a lot of the, the atheists that um, uh, don't use it the way you would find it in philosophy. Um, all right. Um, Jim says, no, I don't believe pigs will do that. What I'm saying is I do believe there are some valid arguments for God... Um, more valid than pigs uh, doing at all what you said, which I think is impossible. Okay, what you, if you, well, it's not impossible logically. It's impossible biologically. But if you think it's impossible, then you believe that it won't happen. See, I, see Jim, uh, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but see what you did? You said, you answered, I don't believe, rather than I believe, which is something that I see Matt Dillahunty do all the time, dishonestly. And I, you're not doing dishonestly. He is. But I, I want you to phrase it in the way not as what you don't believe, because I'm not asking what you don't believe. I'm asking what you believe. Do you believe that pigs will not fly out of my ass because it's biologically impossible? Which is perfectly fine. You can justify that. Go for it. But I want to know what you believe. Say, I believe, and then tell me what you believe. 
Because I don't, because if you say, I don't believe pigs will do that, that doesn't tell me if you believe it won't. This is the whole problem earlier with the video from Matt Delahunty. He's saying, if you don't believe things true, it doesn't mean that you believe it's false. So when you say, I don't believe, I don't know what your position is. I don't know if you're saying you believe that it won't happen or you're agnostic on it. Right? So this is, this is, the, this is the, the sophistry that Matt Dillahunty has. And I don't think you're being sophistic, Jim. But you see, when you say, I don't believe, you're not answering the question then. Because I'm not asking you what you don't believe. I'm asking you, do you hold the belief that pigs won't do it? And if so, you say, I believe that pigs won't do that. Right? Um, i got to wrap this up. These go way too long. By the way, let me promote myself. If you want to become a member of the channel, you get a nice green name, feel free. If you like this kind of subject matter, um, become a member of the channel. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. And if you don't want to do that, you can become a patron of the channel. Link in the video description. Uh, either one is, is fine. Uh, it makes no matter to me. If you become a patron, I, gen I tend to be able to get back. You know, if it, it messages you either, easier, right? Um, because they just go on Patreon, they can message you. And... Uh, so Patreon is kind of easier if you want more communication with me. Um, but if you don't care about that, then become a member of the channel. But here's my Patreon. Um, I'm going to pin that real quick. Uh, I know I suck at self-promotion. I suck at promotion. Um, but either one's fine. Like I said, uh, if you want uh, to help support the channel, there you go. Um, all right, so let's see here. Let me catch up here. Ah. Uh, Um, I know you guys are communicating with each other, so I'm skipping a lot of that stuff. Uh, Get Real says, Theism is a positive belief that God exists, right? It's separating probability from possibility. Well, um, the way Carrier would argue it, and I do kind of agree with Carrier, it's all probabilistic, right? A theist will say God exists on some kind of scale of probability, right? And the atheist says God does not exist on some scale of probability. Um, Jim says, sorry, you misunderstand. What I meant was, do you, why do you want the burden of agnostic instead of atheist? Oh, um, I'm not going to get into the, the details on that. It's, it's, it's not really important right now, and it, it just goes too long. Um, but suffice to say, as an agnostic, I have a burden, yes. But I've, I've met it many times. I've explained it many times. I'm not going to get into it here. Um, but yes, agnostics have a burden. And if agnostics have a burden, then clearly weak atheists have a burden because they're the same logical position. I've proven that using logic. Right? So, if agnostics have a burden, then how can you not have a burden as a weak atheist? And yes, Malik, Dr. Malik, argues that athe agnostics have a burden. And I think he's exactly right on that. Um, let's see here. All right, I think I'm caught up. Um, Gabriel says, I get most of my definitions of atheist from carrier. That's who supply the A prefix explanation, which, again, you know, explained properly, A means negation. A means not. So atheism is the proposition God does not exist, right? Because it's not proposition. Not, you don't take the predication and negate it. You negate the proposition. So if A is negation, it's negation of the proposition of theism. So if proposition is God exists, or at least one God exists, what's the negation of that? God does not exist. If you believe that God does not exist, that's atheism. So a in atheism is not held as, as without, it's held as the negation of the proposition of theism. That's how, that's how it's explained in both the Stanford Encyclopedia by Draper and by Cambridge uh, Dictionary of Atheism. So, Yeah, it doesn't mean the same thing as not theism. We've already been over that. <laughs> so... Um, let me, do you guys want to see my, my, uh, a really short proof, if I can find it, before I leave you guys, of um, my proof that weak atheism um, is the same as uh, agnosticism if you don't have an epistemic status, positive epistemic status? Let me see if I can find it real quick. <clears throat> I know I have it on Twitter. I have to find it. You guys will probably find it easier than I can. Not good at searching stuff on Twitter. I know I have. Here we go. Let me let me screenshot this and I'll.
One second. Okay. Do this, do that. All right, here we go. This is this is this is a really kind of down and dirty proof. I have much longer on my blog, but yeah. So logically, weak atheism um, who aren't strong atheists means they don't have a positive epistemic status on the proposition. There are other epistemic statuses which are positive that you could argue for weak atheists, but they're indirect or second order. Uh, but here's a, here's an actual proof that um, uh, all weak atheists are in fact agnostic and weak theist. Um, Connor says, do I ever sleep? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. Um, it's been well lately, actually. Get Real says, agnostics are non-theist. Yes, agnostics are non-theist and non-atheist. Right? Agnostic is neither theist nor atheist. In fact, that's exactly what um, you, can, you can see by looking at uh, Dr. Demi's work. Right? If you look at his, his paper, the hexagonal, um, the hexagon structure of atheism and theism, he makes it very clear that, um, that an agnostic is somebody who's a non-theist, non-atheist. I'll show you guys that. I'm going way over my time here. Can I get one member out of this? Somebody want to become a member? I'm going to start promoting myself. Can I get a super chat or something? <laughs> I've spent two hours on this. Uh, but I do it for myself more than anything. I mean, I, you know, I, do, I shouldn't say that. I do it for you guys, too. So if you look on Dr. Demi's work, you'll see that um, on the hexagonal structure, which is this, uh, a more advanced version of the square of opposition that I use in my paper, um, agnosticism at the bottom, then you have non-agnostic. Non-agnostics are not theist, and they're not atheist, right? So if you're an agnostic, you cannot be a theist, you cannot be an atheist. They're, they're mutually exclusive from each other. So all agnostics are neither theist or, nor atheist, which, again, craps on all over uh, what Matt Dillahunty said. If you want to look at the logic, this is the logic. that. He so if you look at the very top one, theism um, is equivalent. Okay, this is a bi, it's called a biconditional. Means you can substitute. If you see a non agnostic, non atheist, non agnostic, you can substitute uh, theist or theism. So if you look at the, the logic, for a subject who believes the proposition is true is equivalent, which by, again, by material implication, um, uh, that uh, it does. Uh, I can't read this. It, 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 larger. I just can't see it. I'm sorry. I'm trying to blow it up as large as possible. Um, yeah, I, I can't read that from here. So you guys, you guys, you guys are gonna have to go check it out. But it's basically saying, from what I remember, um, if you're a theist, then you don't, ha you don't not believe God. Well, not, hang on, <laughs> I'm getting close to my screen here. All right, so it says glasses. BSG, which is the belief that God exists. Theism is equivalent to does not believe God does not exist, which would be non-atheism, and does not believe God exists and does not believe God does not exist, which would be Gnosticism. So if that's the case where you're non-agnostic and you're non-atheist, then the only opposite you have left is theist. Right? There you go. That's hard to see. Uh... I think I'm going to wrap it up. My voice is kind of shot. Uh, okay, so any last questions? Anything you got for me before I go? i got to rest before my stream tonight at 9. But, yeah, I think, you know what? You know what's so funny? I'll just leave this on the screen because uh, this is Dr. Demi's paper. Uh, let me see the whole paper. Okay, it, it's, it's Dr. Demi's work, but it, it shows very clearly that there's three categories, theist, atheist, and agnostic. If you're a theist, you're not an atheist, you're not an agnostic. If you're um, a non-theist, you're either an atheist or agnostic. If you're a non-atheist, you're either a theist or an agnostic. 
right? The, the, so there are mutually exclusive. You cannot be a theist, atheist, and agnostic. You cannot be a theist and agnostic. You cannot be a theist and an atheist. And this logic works out. This logic is, is, a, is a logically coherent schema. And it's ubiquitous in the literature, right? I mean, this is how it's understood in philosophy. And so when Matt makes some stupid freaking, um, you know, argument that there's only theist or atheist, then he's just wrong. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just absolutely wrong. It's just, that's what Matt says. No, that's not the right. There we go. I'm trying to show you what Matt said. Uh, there you go. All right, so this is what Matt said. There's only theism and atheism, right? That's what he said. There's only theism and atheism. Well, hey, Matt, I'm going to leave you with this. I'll leave you with this. This paper right here by Dr. Demi is something that refutes you. If you think that you can refute Dr. Demi, there, Matt, go be my guest. Why don't you write a paper like you always tell people to do? Go write a paper. Show somebody that's wrong. Show me the evidence, Matt, because you're, you, you're wrong and you're lying about it. Logic is something that disproves you, and logic is objective. And anybody can go read these papers and see the logic is correct, and you're not. You're absolutely not, Matt. It's not just theist and atheist. And people have explained this to you, and at this point, I, I just going to just throw it out there. Um, I no longer give you principle of charity on this particular topic, Matt. I'm going to say that you are a straight-out dishonest agent. You're dishonestly lying for new atheism, and I think that a lot of atheists who want to learn these things properly, that want to become better understanding of philosophy and atheism and atheology, and they're willing to go out there and say, yeah, there are no gods, let me tell you why, is better for atheism than you lying to people about atheism. I really, honestly, to God, may or may not exist, believe that. I would much rather have atheists go out there and say, there is no God. Let me tell you why. Because at least that's honest. At least they're taking an honest position. I may not have to agree with them that there's no God, but it doesn't matter. I don't have to agree with the theist that there is a God. I don't. But I have more respect for a theist that says, there's a God. Let me give you reasons why. Than a theist who says, there's a God. I don't have to do jack shit. Anyways, um, Josiah, friend, my buddy, Josiah Hansen, how you doing, man? He says, you got this atheist stuff worked out. Now just figure out why YouTube refuses to tell me when these things start. I don't know, man. I don't. I, I have no idea. Uh, YouTube sucks when it comes to that. But anyways, Josiah Hansen, thank you for being a member. I know you've been a member a very long time. Um, hopefully I'll get some new members coming up one of these days. Um, it's just, it's just, <laughs> it's hard. Um, but I, I do got to wrap it up. I got to rest before my stream tonight. I want to thank you guys all for coming out. Um, I hope you got something out of this. Uh, if you want to read my paper, I think I left it in the video description. If not, you can go find it on Academia Edu under my name. Uh, like I said, it's, it's top 0.5%. That's amazing, guys. That's, I mean, and not one person has been able to refute it yet. Not one. Not one. Go figure. You know? um, and like I said, there might be some errors. If Debbie might come back and go, yeah, this paper sucks. <laughs> I'll be like, ah, kill me. Um, but you know, like I said, I want to, you guys to know that I am absolutely going to put my money where my mouth is. If he comes back and says the paper is flawed, I'm going to let you know. And I'll retract it. Right? And if, 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 if that doesn't prove to you that I have intellectual you know, honesty, I don't know what would. I, I, don't, know, I don't know what would. I mean, I'm, I'm out there on my channel telling you that, that I will do that. But I don't see the same intellectual honesty from people like Matt Delahunty. They will not properly evaluate the paper. They won't like, take the time to review it like Demi has. Or, you know, and I, again, I don't know what Demi's going to say about it. Um, but you won't see them reviewing my paper. Of course they won't. But I look forward to your comments. And I'll be back at midnight Eastern um, on a stream. May not have a relevance to what you guys want to talk about, but I think it's important that we do. If I'm up for it at this point, my voice is getting shot. But I will see you guys later, and good night.